so we are successfully done with revising the chapter introduction to audit so then now the next chapter which we are going to revise is the second chapter which is the nature objective scope of audit and also ethics so before i actually go into revising the concepts of this chapter first i want to give one small clarity so the clarity which i want to give here is see the chapter whatever you are able to see in my material the second chapter whatever you are going to see in my material whatever we are going to revise see that is actually a combination of two chapters from the study material this one chapter whatever is there in my material this is actually the combination of two chapters in the study material if i put it in other way around so what i have done is two chapters from the study material i have taken clubbed them together and created one single chapter sir why i did that why i did that combination is why because both the concepts are very closely related to each other so what in fact i have done is i have taken two chapters from the study material combined them together and created one single chapter nature objective and scope of audit and ethics sir what are the two chapters from the study material which you have combined so the two chapters which i have combined in uh, combined from the study material are first chapter and the last chapter first chapter and last chapter in your study material whatever is there so first and last chapter of the study material i have combined together and created one single chapter if i tell you the titles of the chapter also in the study material the first chapter you will be able to find something called nature objective and scope of audit and the last chapter will be something called ethics and terms of engagement ethics and terms of engagement so there are two chapters actually in the study material first chapter nature objective and scope of audit last chapter ethics and terms of engagement so what i have done is since the concept in both the chapters is related to each other i have combined both the chapters and created one single chapter nature objective and scope of audit and ethics so when i am revising this particular chapter i am actually revising two chapters from the study material first and the last chapter leo so this one clarification i wanted to give it so since we are i'm done with the clarification now i will go into the topics see before i actually go into the questions before i actually go into the concepts of this particular chapter one more thing one more uh, concept i will bring it to your attention see at the ca inter level as a part of this paper number 5 auditing and ethics there are a lot of chapters no there are a lot of chapters are there in your study material also you will be able to find a lot of chapters what do you think is the source for your paper number 5 whatever content we are reading i'm not talking about just my material whatever content which is there even in the study material what is the source from where that content in the study material has been taken from from where ici took that content and give it and gave it in your study material so i will say almost all 85% of the content whatever is there as a part of our ca inter audit syllabus 85% of that content has actually been taken from something called standards on audit and the balance 15% of the content whatever we have that is not actually taken from the standards that is taken from practical concepts like laws and regulations like if you take the last two chapters audit of various entities audit of items of financial statements those are very much practical concepts and if you take some chapters like cooperative society audit and if you take a chapter like uh, audit of banks those are actually taken from some laws and regulations so that content which has been taken from other than standards is very minimal only 15% of the entire content has been taken from other than standards. standards but the balance 85% of the content whatever we are about to discuss or whatever we are about to revise as a part of our ca inter audit that has actually been taken from standards on auditing only so the major source from which our syllabus has been taken is what the standards on audit so which means that whenever i am teaching you certain chapter i am actually teaching you certain set of standards if i say i am teaching you certain chapter i am actually trying to teach you a few standards on auditing so when i say i am going to teach you this chapter nature objective and scope of audit and also ethics so when i say i am going to teach you this chapter i am teaching you nothing but two standards here actually so those two standards are sa 200 and sa 210 so when i say i am going to teach you this chapter nature objective and scope of audit and ethics i am teaching you nothing but two standards on audit which two standards uh, i have been teaching you now sa 200 and sa 210 nothing but this entire chapter whatever we are going to discuss whatever we are about to discuss that entire chapter has been taken from two standards sa 200 and sa 210 and that's what we are going to learn as a part of this chapter 
sir and what kind of concept will be there in this chapter what exactly this chapter will teach us very simple guys in the previous chapter whatever we are done with just now so in the introduction chapter what did we understand in the introduction chapter just we got to know what is the meaning of the term audit and we got to know we got familiar with the basic terminology which will be used in the entire subject of the audit that's what we have understood we did not understand any advanced concepts in the chapter introduction to audit what in fact we have understood is we just understood what is the meaning of the term audit and we understood a few basic terms which we are going to use it throughout this entire subject called audit like what is financial information what is a misstatement what is material what is applicable financial reporting framework we just got familiar with the basic terminology whatever we are about to use in the entire subject of the audit clear so now in this chapter nature objective of nature objective and scope and ethics what in fact we are going to discuss in this chapter is on the basic terminology which we understood we are going to build some concepts on the basis of terminology whatever we have understood in the introduction chapter on that basic terminology we are going to build the concepts of the audit like if i have to put it in other way around like if you take a scenario of construction of a building by discussing introduction we have just laid the foundation we have just we have just laid the foundation for the building called audit now on that foundation we are going to build the pillars on which entire building is going to stand so we got to know the basic terminology on the basis of that we are going to learn few more basic concepts which are relating to the subject of audit so that's what we are going to discuss in this chapter nature object and scope of audit and also ethics so if i list out a few concepts which we are about to revise see we are going to think something we are going to talk something like what are what are going to be various types of audit so what is going to be the entire purpose of the audit what are the minimum points which auditor will verify while doing the audit what are the principal aspects which are required to be covered in an audit what will be included in the scope of the audit what will be included in the scope of the audit and also we are going to talk about few more things like ethics what are the ethical requirements which auditor has to follow there is something called inherent limitations that's what we are going to discuss so like this on the basis of introduction on the basis of fundamentals whatever we have understood we are going to build the basic concepts relating to audit so that is what going to be the agenda for this entire chapter called nature objective and scope of audit and also ethics clear so having said that now we will take up each and every concept for our discussion see we already know what is the meaning of the audit we have already revised in a perfect manner what is the meaning of audit and i hope by now you all will remember the definition of audit can somebody let me know what is the definition of audit so by now i hope so you all would have already remembered it so audit is defined something like this audit is an independent examination of financial information of an entity whether profit oriented or not irrespective of its size or legal form when such an examination is conducted with a view to express an opinion thereon so we got to know we everybody got to know what is the meaning of the term audit so now let us try to address the next question what is going to be the purpose of audit what is the purpose of audit why audit as a function has existed very simple guys the purpose of the audit is to enhance the confidence of users of the financial statements whoever the users of the financial statements are there to increase their confidence to enhance their confidence levels the audit as a function has been introduced if i give you explanation regarding this see who will prepare financial statements management as we all know management will prepare the financial statements now these financial statements will be used by different users let us take for example one important user of the financial statements is shareholder see management or the people who will run the business who will take the decisions they are the people who will prepare the financial statements so management is preparing the financial statements and assume that there is no audit function in between those financial statements which are prepared by the management if they are directly given to the shareholders what will happen so what will happen is shareholders will not have confidence on that financial statements which are prepared by the management why because being a shareholder you don't know what is exactly happening inside the company so board of directors are only taking decisions management is only running the show management has only prepared the financial statements and they are only asking you to believe that financial statements so in such a circumstances as a shareholder you will not have confidence on that financial statements which are prepared by the management so if in the financial statements they have told there are fixed assets worth 100 crores what is the guarantee really inside the company there are fixed assets worth of 100 crores what is the guarantee for the shareholder so shareholder will not have that much confidence so in order to increase the confidence of the shareholder what the regulatory authorities or what the industry has thought is once the financial statements are prepared by the management now one independent qualified and competent person 
one independent qualified and competent that is capable person who is that independent qualified and capable person you and me chartered accountants currently me future you so the independent and qualified and competent person a chartered accountant that is an auditor will verify the financial statements check for its authenticity and validity check whether those financial statements are genuine and valid or not on that he will give opinion then these financial statements will become audited financial statements and if those audited financial statements are given to the shareholder they will have more confidence the confidence of the shareholders will get increased so what is the logic behind increasing of that confidence of the shareholders the simple logic is before the financial statements reach the user one independent qualified competent person is verifying the financial statements checking for its authenticity that is validity and genuinity of the financial statements then they are given to the shareholder that will enhance the confidence of the users of the financial statements so that is what the entire purpose of audit engagement not just audit engagement for most of the uh, for most of the external engagements the entire purpose is to enhance the confidence of users of the financial statements that is what the reason behind this introduction of a uh, area called audit Okay, so we understood what is the purpose of the audit. Now, let me ask you one more question. Is audit mandatory for all kinds of organization? Do you think whatever audit which we are, uh, whatever the concept of audit I have explained, do you think is that function audit, is it mandatory for each and every organization? Just you give a thought. So you might be knowing so many people who are doing business, might be your relatives, might be your friends, might be your close family. Do you think each and every of your known person, whoever is doing the business, are everyone going to a chartered accountant and getting their accounts audited? Your answer might be no. That means from this we can conclude that audit is not mandatory for each and every organization. Audit is not going to be mandatory for each and every organization. So depending on the applicability, depending on the requirements, the audits can be broadly divided into two categories. Depending on requirements of the law, the audits can be broadly divided into two categories. Number one is statutory audit and the other one is non-statutory audit. So on the basis of what we are doing this classification, on the basis of requirements of law, we can divide audits into two categories. Number one, statutory audit and number two, non-statutory audit. So let us try to understand what is a statutory audit. What is the meaning of the statute? Statute means some law or regulation. What is the meaning of statutory audit? Those audits which are mandatorily required under some law or regulation, under any law or regulation, those audits we are going to call them as statutory audits. Under certain law, under certain law or regulation, if an audit has been made mandatory, so that kind of audits we are going to call it as statutory audits. If I have to give you a few examples, take for example company audit. Companies Act 2013 has clearly told that each and every company must get their accounts audited. So since it is made mandatory under Companies Act, under some law or regulation, so company audit becomes a statutory audit. Or you take Cooperative Societies Audit, which has been made mandatory under Cooperative Societies Act. Or you take Bank Audit, which has been made mandatory under the Banking Regulation Act. Or you take Income Tax Audit, which has been made mandatory in certain cases under Section 44AB of the Income Tax Act. So like that, you take any audit which has been made mandatory under certain law or regulation, those audits we are going to call them as statutory audits. So then what will be the meaning of non-statutory audit? Very simple, those audits, even though there is no requirement of law, if the client is voluntarily coming forward and getting his accounts audited, there is no law asking you to get the accounts audited. But still, if you voluntarily come and get their accounts audited, those audits, we are going to call them as non-statutory audits. Like for example, sole proprietor's audit. See, in case of a sole proprietor, there is no governing law. There is no law which will ask the sole proprietor to get his accounts audited. But still, if the sole proprietor is coming forward and getting his accounts audited, voluntarily out of his own choice, is going to get his accounts audited. We call them as non-statutory or voluntary audits. Or even you take partnership firm's audit. That is also one of the example of non-statutory audit. Clients voluntarily coming and getting their accounts audited. Now you all might get a doubt, sir, even though there is no requirement of the law, why the clients will get their accounts audited? Because the conduct of audit gives so many advantages to the clients. That's why even though there is no requirement of the law, the clients will still come and get their accounts audited because there are so many advantages which we will talk about in a while what are that advantages for conduct of audit that we will talk it that we will talk about later but for the time being now even though there is no requirement they still come and get their accounts audited so those audits we are going to call them as non statutory audits clear everybody so this is the major point of difference one is statutory compulsory under law non statutory voluntary audits even though there is no requirement of law 
one more point of difference i will tell you see in the case of statutory audit where the audit has been made mandatory who do you think will decide the scope and objective that means what auditor has to cover what things are required to be included in the audit what are rights of auditor what are rights of client what are object what are responsibilities of auditor what are responsibilities of the client so these are scope and objective will be decided by whom so in case of statutory audit the scope and objective will be decided by law itself under whatever law the audit has been made mandatory the same law will decide what what is the scope and objective of the auditor what auditor is expected to do what are rights of auditor what are responsibilities of auditor everything will be decided by the respective law only under whatever law audit has been made mandatory the same law will even decide the scope and objective also sir what about non statutory audit in this case who will decide the scope and objective there is no law here itself which is asking the audit to get it done then who will decide the scope of uh, who will decide the scope and objective very simple by way of terms of engagement when i say terms of engagement very simple the client and the auditor sit across the table they mutually discuss and decide what is the scope and objective of the auditor whereas in the case of statutory audit law will decide the scope and objective of the audit one more thing also they say in the case of statutory audit they say scope and objective will be decided by law and also terms of engagement very important point i'm going to tell you very important concept i'm going to tell you see in the case of non statutory audit scope and objective will be decided purely by way of mutual discussion but in the case of statutory audit they have told scope and objective will be decided by law also and also by way of mutual discussion between auditor and the client but one important point here for our attention is that by way of terms of engagement whatever scope and objective which has been decided under law that can be only extended law will tell you certain scope and objective if you want you can extend that scope and objective by way of mutual discussion but by way of terms of engagement no auditor no client can reduce the scope and objective which is already decided under law so when i say the terms of engagement will be the scope and objective will be decided by terms of engagement in the case of statutory audit what do i mean by that is by way of terms of engagement by way of mutual discussion between the auditor and the client the scope and objective which is already decided under law can only be extended but in any case it cannot be reduced it can only be extended like for example if the law is asking the auditor is giving the auditor some 20 responsibilities by way of mutual extend by way of mutual discussion if you want to add some ex extra to you can do it but do you think the client and auditor by way of mutual discussion can they come and reduce out of this 20 can they make a discussion and reduce that reporting responsibilities to 18 no that can never happen if they want they can increase but they never can reduce the scope and objective which is already decided under law clear so two differences i have told one meaning other one who will decide scope and objective now there is one more point of difference but to understand that one more point of difference we need to go deeper into the concept of independence we need to go deeper into the concept of independence so we already know i have already explained you what is the basic meaning of the term independence so in the introduction chapter itself i have told independence means what from the perspective of audit from the subject perspective of audit what do you think is the meaning of the term independence so i told you that independence is a nature or characteristic or quality of a person to take the decisions without any influence the ability the characteristic or the nature of a person to take decision without any influence from the third party we are going to call that characteristic that nature of the person as independent now from the auditing perspective independence will be of two types from the auditing perspective independence will be of two types one is independence of mind and the other one is independence of appearance so let us try to understand this concept of independence of mind and independence of appearance in a detailed manner important concept so independence of mind means the state of mind the agreement of the mind to act independently if i make a decision in my mind i am going to do the audit of this client independently then that becomes independence of mind an agreement of mind a state of mind to act independently that we call it as independence of mind whereas independence of appearance means the name itself says we have to appear to be independent that means you should not have any kind of relationship any kind of association with the client which will look as if independence has been compromised so not having any kind of relationship or association with the client for which you are doing so that we call it as independence of appearance 
whereas independence of mind is nothing but it is like a feeling it is an agreement in mind it is acceptance in the mind that i am going to do the audit of this client independently that acceptance in the mind that state of mind i am going to call it as independence of mind whereas independence of appearance means not having any relationship not having any association with the client for which i am doing the audit that free from relationship free from association i call it as independence of appearance so let me give you one example let me give you one example to understand take for example there is a student there is a student he has written an exam he has written an exam so there is a answer sheet so this is the answer sheet written by the student so take uh, a student like you he has given a ca examination so board examination he has given now assume this student's father is also a practicing chartered accountant the student's father or mother is a practicing chartered accountant and they have applied for verification of answer sheets of the students and your answer sheet has gone to your parent for the purpose of verification your answer sheet has gone to your parent for the purpose of verification now you what your parent has thought is okay this answer sheet might belong to my son or daughter this answer sheet might belong to my son or daughter but i will treat this answer sheet as some person who is not related to me i will treat this answer sheet as a uh, normal person's answer sheet and i will evaluate it correctly i will allocate the marks only whatever this answer sheet deserves so your parent has made a decision in the mind that he will evaluate this he will verify this answer sheet without any bias without any influence so he agreed in his mind to do the verification independently that state of mind here the parent is having independence of mind yes he has made an agreement in mind to verify the answer sheet independently but if you see here there is a existence of relationship between the verifier and the person whoever has done the work there is a relationship what is that relationship parent and a child parent and a child so because of this relationship you are not appearing to be independent you don't look independent the parent might have agreed in the mind independence of mind is there but here there is a existence of relationship or appearance because of it you are not appearing you are not looking to be independent independence of appearance is not there independence of appearance is not there one simple common example to understand now let us try to understand these concepts from the perspective of audit take for example there is a client there is a sole proprietor he is doing a business he is doing some business now he wants to get his business audited he wants to get his business audited he went to a chartered accountant he went to a chartered accountant who is none other than his brother who is none other than his brother so he asked his brother who is a chartered accountant to do the audit of his business to do the audit of his business now if you take this case this chartered accountant has agreed in his mind i will do the audit of this business independently i will not treat this business as my brother's business i will treat this business as some unrelated person's business and i will do the audit independently he made a agreement in mind so independence of mind is there for this brother but there is a association between audit and client there is a relationship they both are brothers they both are relatives so even though there is a independence of mind there is no independence of appearance they don't appear to be independent why they don't appear to be independent because of a existence of a relationship so independence of mind means a state of mind to act independently independence of appearance means not having any kind of association or relationship with the client for which you are doing the audit that we call it as independence of appearance so like this independence will be of two categories independence of mind and independence of appearance and i hope with the examples whatever i have used you have got the clarity so why i told you this is i am going to relate this independence with the audits types of audits do you think in the case of statutory audit in the case of statutory audits in the case of those audits which are mandatorily required under law do you think auditor should be independent yes auditor should be 100% independent and what kind of independence is required is independence of mind is required or independence of appearance is required or independence of both is required in the case of statutory audit independence of mind is also required independence of appearance is also required both are required in the case of statutory audit whereas when it comes to non statutory audit auditor should be independent here also independence of the auditor is required but independence of mind is enough independence of appearance is not required in the case of non statutory audit independence of appearance is not required one simple logic i will tell you see if you are a sole proprietor no one is asking you to get your accounts audited you voluntarily go and want to get your accounts audited you voluntarily want to go and get your accounts audited now if you go to your brother and get your accounts audited if you go to some outsider and get your accounts audited no one will be bothered at all 
So if you are a sole proprietor, if you are voluntarily going and getting your accounts audited and if you are getting that accounts audited by your brother, no one will come and ask you why you are getting your accounts audited by your brother. Why? Because no law is expecting you to do the audit only. You voluntarily doing it, whether you do it by your relative or an outside person, no one is bothered. So in the case of non-statutory audit, independence of appearance is not required. Independence of mind alone will be enough. So these two are the types of audits on the basis of requirements of the law. Hope you guys have understood so what did i teach you till now i have explained you what is the purpose of the audit what are the various types of audit now let us talk about one more small concept called advantages of audit see i told even though there is no requirement of the law some clients will get their accounts audited so you all will get a doubt sir what is the purpose why the clients will get their accounts audited even though there is no requirement of the audit why because as i was telling there are certain advantages of the there are certain advantages because of which the client might feel that uh, the client might feel i will go and get the accounts audited even though there is no requirement sir what advantages will be there by going and getting the accounts audited what advantages will be there so if you see here it will safeguard the financial interest of the person who are not associated with the management if the accounts if the if the audit of the accounts happen it will protect the interest of the people who are not associated with the management like shareholders bankers etc these are not a part of the management if audit happens their interest will be protected see one of the examination they have asked a true or false statement so what true or false statement they have asked is it safeguard the financial audit safeguard the financial interest of the persons who are associated with the management they have removed this term not at the post and they asked the question is it true or false it is false actually the audit purpose is it will safeguard the interest of the people who are not a part of the management see who are already who are already a part of the management why their interest is required to be safeguarded so audit will safeguard the financial interest of the person who are not associated with the management number one first advantage number two it acts as a moral check on the employees of the client if audit happens the employees of the clients will have fear in their mind even if you do some mistake tomorrow auditor will come and do the verification he will catch us if the management knows they will remove us that fear will be there in the minds of the employees if you get your accounts audited it is helpful for settling the liability for taxes tax issues can be sorted in an easy manner if audited financial statements are there you can easily negotiate the loans and also in case of acquisitions and all purchase consideration can be easily determined on the basis of audited financial statements and these audited financial statements will help in settling trade disputes and also insurance claims it will help you to detect any wastages and losses losses happening in the organization and also the client will come to know by undergoing audit whether he has maintained all the necessary books of accounts as required by law and in the case of partnership firm the audited financial statements will help in the settlement of the accounts between the partners in the case of admission or death or retirement of the partners and even when you need a license from the government for carrying out certain businesses, government will say we will give you license only when you bring audited financial statements. So if you get your accounts audited, it will also become easy for you to get your licenses, licenses or grants from the government. So these are the various advantages because of which the clients will prefer to go for audit even though there is no statutory requirement. So even if they ask you the question, what are advantages of audit? What are benefits of audit? These things you can write here. So we are done with this concept also. Now let us address the next question. See the next concept is, see when you are going to do the audit, you are required to express an opinion. Before you express the opinion, what are the basic things? What are the minimum things which you will check before expression of opinion? To satisfy yourself that financial statements does not mislead anybody. So before you, uh, the ultimate objective of the audit is you are required to express an opinion. Now, before you express that opinion, some basic things you will check in the financial statements, no? Some basic things you will check in the financial information. So, what are that basic points which you will verify before you express the opinion? So, that is what this question is. Explain the points which auditor should consider before expression of opinion. So, before you express that opinion, what basic things you will try to verify? Very simple, in the answer, they will say six basic things we will try to verify before we express our opinion. Number one, whether the financial statements are prepared in accordance with the books of accounts. So the source for the preparation of financial statements is books of accounts. So the, whatever is there in the books of accounts, the same thing should come even in my financial statements also. So the first point which auditor needs to verify whether the financial statements are in agreement with books of accounts or not. Number two, whatever entries in the books of accounts are there, those entries in the books of accounts should be supported by proper evidence whatever entries in the books of accounts are there there should be evidence for that entries in the books of accounts that is what i need to check third one i need to make sure that there are no omissions 
in the financial statements whatever entries are there in the books of accounts they should not be omitted from the financial statements and also there should not be any fake entries there should not be any fake entries so this also i need to verify so i need to make sure that there are no omissions and there are also no fake entries this is also one basic thing which i will check number four i should check that the information conveyed in the financial statement should be clear and unambiguous that means whatever information you are trying to present in the financial statements that information should be clear and unambiguous sir what is unambiguous that should not create any confusion by reading the financial statements and user should get the clarity he should not get confused number five i need to check whatever amounts classification presentation and disclosure are there whether they are done as per accounting standards whether accounting standards are complied with or not one more basic thing which i will check number six finally i have to check whether the financial statements are giving a true and fair view of state of affairs and uh, financial results so these are the six basic things six minimum points which i will check before expression of my opinion the same thing we have tried to uh, give here also so the first thing the the person conducting the audit should take care to ensure that financial statements would not mislead anybody how he can ensure that financial statements will not mislead anybody by checking a few points which points is a so whether accounts have been drawn with reference to entries in the books of accounts nothing but financial statements are matching with books of accounts and entries in the books of accounts should be supported by evidence there should not nothing should have been omitted in the books of accounts and nothing which is not in the books of accounts should be there in the financial statements nothing but no omissions no fake entries and information should be clear and unambiguous and whatever amounts classification presentation and disclosures are there they should be in conformity with the accounting standards and finally the financial statement should give a true and fair picture these are the six minimum points which i will check before expression of my opinion clear everybody now so i want to talk about one more thing see whenever we are giving opinion see till now whatever discussion we had i was always telling as an auditor your objective is to express an opinion your objective is to express an opinion so our opinion the opinion expressed by the auditor should not be taken as a guarantee the opinion expressed by the auditor should not be taken as a guarantee and specifically the opinion expressed by the auditor should not be taken as a guarantee regarding two things the opinion expressed by the auditor should not be taken as a guarantee especially regarding two things why because most of the people will have a misconception so the opinion expressed by the auditor is not a guarantee regarding future viability of the entity the opinion expressed by the auditor is not a guarantee regarding future viability of the entity sir what is the meaning of this take for example i have conducted the audit of the financial statements of the client x limited when i verified the financial information i did not find out any material misstatement i gave a positive opinion now when i give positive opinion on the financial statements do i mean i am giving a guarantee that this company will continue forever in the future this company is having good future you can invest your money in the company there is there is no chance company will incur loss in the future am i giving that guarantee no the opinion expressed by the auditor is not at all a guarantee regarding future viability when i when i have given positive opinion i am not giving any guarantee regarding the future I am not giving any guarantee regarding future. As an auditor, I have nothing to do with the future. What I have done is, I have verified historical financial information. I have verified financial information. That to which financial information? I have verified historical financial information and have just expressed my opinion whether that historical financial information, the information which has already taken place in the past, whether it is giving true and fair view or not, that's what I have done. So when I have given my opinion, I am not giving any guarantee regarding future viability of the entity. Also, the auditor's opinion is also not a guarantee for efficiency and effectiveness of management. Sir, what does that mean? See, which means that, take for example, if I have given a positive opinion on the financial statements of some entity, I have conducted audit of some company and on that company's financial information, I have given a positive opinion. So, if I give a positive opinion on the financial statements of an entity, does that mean, am I giving a guarantee that the management of that company are effective, the management of that company are honest, the management of that company are efficient, am I giving any conduct certificate regarding the management? No. So, whenever I express my opinion, my opinion cannot be taken as a guarantee regarding future viability of the entity and my opinion also cannot be taken as a guarantee regarding efficiency and effectiveness of the management. I have nothing to do with the future of the company, I have nothing to do with the efficiency and effectiveness of the management. 
so being an auditor i verify financial information that to historical financial information the information which has already taken place in the past so historical financial information i am going to verify and on that i will express my opinion whether it is reliable or not that's it my opinion can't be taken as a guarantee regarding future viability my opinion also can't be taken as a guarantee regarding efficiency and effectiveness of management so that is what uh, here has been given auditor's opinion is not a guarantee so what we have understood till now so we have understood the types of audit we have also understood uh, what are the advantages of the audit and what points you are required to consider before expression of opinion and also what is the purpose of the audit i have explained even we have also understood a few more aspects just now like the auditor's opinion is not a guarantee for certain things so let us try to understand few more concepts so we'll try to understand a small concept called qualities of an auditor if you want to become an auditor so what kind of qualities you have to possess so if an auditor wants to become a good auditor he needs to possess a combination of personal qualities as well as professional qualities to become a uh, to become an ideal auditor to become a good auditor you need to have two kinds of qualities a combination of two qualities will make an auditor a good auditor so what are the, which, which combination of qualities personal qualities and professional qualities sir what are the professional qualities professional qualities are nothing but those qualities which you acquire by way of your formal education like if you want to become a good auditor you need to have a good knowledge of auditing concepts and standards you need to have good knowledge of accounting you need to be good at your taxation laws indirect and direct tax laws you need to be uh, you need to be you need to have good knowledge about laws and regulations like specific laws which are applicable to your client like for example if i'm conducting audit of a company i need to have a good knowledge of companies act in addition to that you need to have knowledge about good knowledge of general laws and regulations also when i say general laws and regulations like indian contract act sale of goods act partnership act so i need to have knowledge of specific laws which are applicable for my client i need to have a knowledge of general laws and regulations also and i need to have a good knowledge of management general management nothing but our strategic management i need to have good knowledge about information systems that means i need to i i should be able to understand the information systems which my client is using because today we know no entity is maintaining the accounts in a manual manner they are all using softwares in such an environment if you expect me to do the audit i need to have a good knowledge on information technologies also so if i want to become a good auditor i need to have these professional qualities nothing but a good knowledge of all the subjects so you have to write the list of all the subjects which are there in our ca curriculum so having professional qualities alone will not be enough to become a good auditor you need to even have something called personal qualities also to become a good auditor you need to have some personal qualities also sir what personal qualities like you should be a honest person you should be a sincere person you should have integrity and also you should be able to take the judgments you should have good judgmental skills you should be clear headed you should have clarity of thought right you should have a good temper so all those qualities which make a person a good person all those qualities are also required to even become a good auditor also so in order to become an ideal auditor or in order to become a good auditor you need to possess a combination of personal as well as professional qualities understood everybody and one more thing in uh, see the beauty of the subject of audit is the audit is not a stand alone subject audit is not a stand alone subject the audit will have relationship with various other disciplines also the audit is going to have relationship with other disciplines also like the subject of auditing is linked with various other subjects so if you want to do the audit in a audit in a proper way you need to have the knowledge of the other subjects as well other disciplines as well sir what are that various other domains or what are that various other disciplines which will have a relationship with the auditing or if i put it in other way around how audit is related or uh audit is related with what and all other subjects so we will have a concept regarding the same like if you see here explain the relationship of auditing with other disciplines disciplines in the sense other subjects or other other uh, domains actually so like if you see auditing and accounts are they related yes see as an auditor we are required to verify financial information financial information is nothing but outcome of the accounting process only no so definitely auditing and accounts are both related with each other next auditing and law even we even the subject of auditing is also related with law like for example we need we need to have good knowledge of income tax law we need to have knowledge of gst laws we need to have knowledge of company law etc so even the subject of auditing and law are also related with each other and the subject of auditing is even having a relationship with economics also like we will be concerned mainly with the micro economics than the macro economics so auditing and economics is also related with each other auditing and behavioral science behavioral science means nothing but psychology human psychology 
see in the audit we will do verification but for doing that verification during the course of audit we need to interact with the different people we need to interact with management we need to interact with employees so you should have some psychology skills to extract the information from the knowledgeable persons like you need to have some skill if you ask questions in what manner you will be able to extract the information so that human behavior also you need to know it they are not asking you to do some a phd in the psychology but just they are telling but just they are trying to say that auditing is even related with behavioral sciences also and auditing is related with statistics and mathematics see in audit generally we verify the transactions on sampling basis and how that samples and all will be selected on the basis of statistical concepts and even the subject of audit is related with mathematics also and auditing is related with data processing nothing but information technology as i was telling you just now today maintenance of manual accounts has become a history everybody is maintaining the accounts in computers if you have to do the audit of the accounts you also should become familiar on how to use the information technology for that you need to have knowledge about this information technology so the subject of auditing is even related with something called data processing nothing but information technology and the subject of auditing is related with financial management also see in financial management you will have a chapter called ratio analysis so whatever you learn in the chapter called ratio analysis that we are directly going to use it in the audit generally by way of analytical procedures for that we have a dedicated chapter we will talk about that later but for the time being now i want you to remember even the subject of auditing is related with financial management also and not just that auditing is even related with production production in the sense they are referring to costing here so if they ask you the question explain the relationship of auditing with various other disciplines this is what you are supposed to write auditing and accounts is related auditing and law is related audit is having a relationship with economics auditing is also having a relationship with behavioral science it is having a relationship with statistics and mathematics it is having a relationship with data processing it is having relationship with financial management it is also having a relationship with production or costing clear and comfortable everybody so this is what regarding relationship of auditing with other disciplines comfortable everybody now so we will address one more concept now we will try to cover a concept called principal aspects what and all are principal aspects which are required to be covered in an audit very very important from the examination perspective uh, in the earlier exams they have asked this question multiple times so here the question will not be tricky at all they will somewhere mention straight away in the question uh, to ask to uh, asking you to write about the principal aspects nothing but what are the main aspects what are the compulsory aspects which you have to cover it as a part of your audit so a list of principal aspects has been given here let us try to understand what are all that principal aspects which you are required to cover in an audit so number one as you could see one of the main aspect which you have to cover in the audit is you have to understand about clients accounting and internal control system you have to understand about clients accounting system and also internal control system so two terms they are using here number one they are asking us to understand and test the clients accounting system and number two they are also asking us to understand about clients internal control system see these terms we are going to use it at the multiple places so we will try to spend some time in understanding what is the meaning of this accounting system what is the meaning of this internal control system i will try to summarize it in a simple way accounting system means nothing but a collection or a combination of processes the tools the techniques the softwares whatever they are using for maintaining the books of accounts of the client that we call it as accounting system like for example if your client is using tally for maintaining books of accounts then the tally becomes their accounting system if the client is using sap then sap becomes their accounting system if the client is following certain processes like for example they have a process to write the ochers before passing entries uh, this voucher maintenance system will become accounting system so like that a combination of tools or processes techniques or softwares whatever the client is using for maintaining their books of accounts that combination of tools softwares techniques we are going to call it as accounting system so then what is internal control system this is interesting thing see in fact we have a dedicated chapter talking about internal controls its components and all that we will have a detailed discussion regarding internal control in risk assessment and internal control chapter but till that point of time at various instances we will continuously come across this term called internal controls so what i will do is i will give you a brief about internal control now that discussion you remember but the detailed discussion the in-depth understanding of internal controls we will have it in the chapter called risk assessment and internal control so now i am going to tell you brief sir what is the meaning of internal control system any simple any policy any procedure 
which is designed implemented or maintained by the management or those charged with governance by the top level management of the organization that policy and procedure i am going to call it as internal control any policy or any procedure which is designed implemented maintained by some management of the entity to prevent some mistakes from happening in the organization those policies systems procedures which are implemented for preventing mistakes from happening in the organization that i am going to call it as internal control system let me give you one simple some simple examples to make you understand take for example there is a it company there is a it company now it company wants to make sure that or it company's management has put a policy that if a person if an employee has to enter inside the company this is the premises of the company if an employee want to enter inside the premises of the company the company has put a policy that there will be entry gate here at the entry gate they have to show their identity card and they have to give their biometric then only the gate will open after that only you can enter inside the campus so this is a policy set by the management that every person has to enter inside the company only by scanning his identity card and giving the biometric access so this is the policy which is kept by the management why this policy has been kept this policy has been kept to make sure that mistakes will not happen in the organization to make sure that no unauthorized person enters inside the it company so this is a policy set by the management to ensure that there is no mistake happening in the organization so this policy of showing the identity card and giving the biometric i can simply call this as a internal control you can simply call this as a internal control or let me give you a few more examples the company has put a policy that the warehouse the warehouse wherever stock is kept that in that warehouse cctv cameras should be installed and there should be a person who should be monitoring that cctv footage the company has put a policy that the warehouse wherever the stock is getting kept that warehouse should be surrounded by cctv camera and that cctv footage should be monitored by one person this is a policy kept by the management of some company this installation of cctv cameras also i can call it as internal control why because this policy is implemented to make sure that misstatements don't happen the mistakes don't happen in the organization or company has put from the accounts perspective i will tell you one internal control company has put a policy that if there is a cashier the cash cashier should be given the responsibility of only making payments and receiving the receipts the company has put a policy that the the cashier should only make payments and collect receipts he should not pass an accounting entry he should not pass a entry regarding cash in the books of accounts accounting entry should always be passed by some another person called accountant so the company has put a policy to divide the responsibilities of cashier and accountant the company has put a policy that the cashier should be responsible only for making payments and collecting the receipts he should not pass accounting entry accounting entry should always be passed by accountant only this we popularly call in the industry as segregation of duties this is also one internal control this is also one internal control a policy set by the management of the organization or the company has put a policy that an accountant will pass an entry <clears throat> an accountant before he passes an entry he has to write a voucher and that voucher should be given to concerned manager that manager should approve that entry then only entry should be recorded in the books of accounts so the company has put a policy that before passing an entry accountant should write a voucher that voucher should be approved by the manager then only entry will get recorded in the books of accounts policy set by the management this also i can call it as internal control this also i can call it as internal control so like this numerous examples i can give you so you might have already come across internal controls in various businesses as a part of your day to day life but just the thing is you don't know that it is an internal control so simply if you visit any supermarket and if you see before you enter inside that supermarket security guard will check you that is a policy set by the management of the company so checking of the security guard before entering a supermarket internal control so once you have entered inside the supermarket each and every nook and corner will be covered by the cctv footage uh, internal control now once you do the shopping you have to go to the billing counter there the there they will uh, do the billing on the basis of barcode scanning when they scan the barcode on the item price and discount will get automatically captured policy set by the management internal control after you have done the shopping before you leave the store there will be a security guard standing at the exit gate he will check the items which are there in your trolley whether they are included in the bill or not security guard will check then only he will send you out internal control 
So like this, I can give you numerous examples. So if I have to summarize what is this internal control, so as an auditor, if I have to summarize this internal control, it simply means that any policy or procedure which is designed, implemented or maintained by the management of the organization to prevent the mistakes happening in the organization that I will be call it as internal control. See, this is the simple meaning. This I have told you in a simple way. There is actually a technical definition for the term internal control. There is a lot of discussion revolving around the term internal control. This we will talk about it later in the chapter risk assessment and internal control. Clear? So for the time being now, just did you get the clarity, basic clarity, what exactly is internal control? I hope so. You have got it. So why we have discussed about accounting system, internal control system, from where, from which part of the concept we have come here. We are actually trying to discuss something called principal aspects, main aspects which you have to cover in the audit. In that first point, one of the main aspect you are required to cover is relating to accounting and internal control. So then we took some time and understood what is accounting system, what is internal control system. So now let us see what is the principal aspect, what is the main aspect we have to cover in the audit. So you have to examine the client's accounting system and internal control system to ascertain whether it is appropriate for the business and helps in properly recording all the transactions. So first a principal aspect, as an auditor you should get it, you should examine the client's accounting system, the client's internal control system, determine whether that accounting system followed by the client, whatever internal control system followed by the client, are they appropriate? And do they help the organization to record all the transactions in a proper manner? Nothing but we should get an overall understanding of client's accounting system, internal control system. Number two, second point, reviewing the systems and procedures to find out whether they are adequate and comprehensive and whether material inadequacies and weaknesses exist to allow the frauds and errors getting unnoticed. So first, in the first point, see both the points are relating to internal controls only. So what is the difference is in the first point, they ask us to obtain an understanding. They are just trying to trying us to asking us to understand about clients accounting system, internal control system. Second point, after you have done the understanding, now you perform in-depth procedures and try to find out whether in that internal control system, is there any weakness? Is there any inadequacy which will allow the frauds or errors to happen? Like for example, you have understood internal control, you came to know that your client is following one internal control of installing the CCTV cameras. But I came to know that even after, un of, even after installing the CCTV cameras, the footage is not getting monitored. That means internal control is there, but in that internal control there is a weakness, because of that weakness it is creating a scope for fraud or error to happen able to understand so that is what two things we have to say regard you have to see regarding accounting and internal control system one of the main aspect number one try to get overall understanding number two try to do in-depth procedures to find out whether there is any weakness or deficiency in that internal control system so that is the first point second one so first point is regarding accounting and internal control system next one we need to check arithmetical accuracy arithmetical accuracy means what whether the calculations, calculation of profit, balance sheet, additions, deletions, all this have been correctly calculated or is there any arithmetical error? That also we need to verify. But this point is no longer relevant today. Why? Because today the accounts are maintained in the software. All the arithmetic calculations like additions, subtractions, all that things will be automatically done by the software. And we can rely on the software to the extent of arithmetical accuracy. But still, they are asking us the second main aspect which we have to check is arithmetical accuracy. Third one, we also need to check authenticity and validity of the transactions. Authenticity means genuinity. Whatever transactions are there in the books of accounts, are they authentic? Are they genuine? Are they valid? That also you have to cover. Sir, how I will come to know whether a transaction is genuine and valid? Simply with the help of supporting documents. Like if you want to know whether a purchase is correct or not, supporting document you have to verify, invoice. If you want to know whether rent payment is correct or not, supporting document, rental agreement you have to verify. So like that, whether the transactions in the books of accounts are authentic, that is genuine and valid or not that also you need to verify and you have to verify it on the basis of supporting documents then one more important aspect which you need to cover proper distinction has been made between capital and revenue items this is also one of the main aspect which you have to cover and also amount of various items and expenditure adjusted in the accounts correspond to the, the relevant accounting period only nothing but if i put it in simple way whatever incomes and expenses which are recorded in the books of accounts they should belong only to the current year none of the future years incomes and expenses should be recorded in the current year none of the past years incomes and expenses should be recorded in the current year so whatever has been recorded they should correspond they should relate to the current year only that also we need to verify then we need to compare balance sheet and pnl account with 
books of accounts nothing but whether financial statements are matching with the books of accounts same point we have seen in the first question also points which are required to be covered next one we need to verify various items of the financial statements we need to verify assets also we need to verify liabilities also and even we need to verify the items in the statement of pnl that is incomes and expenses also we have to verify so all items of the financial statements we have to verify in addition to that in case if you are conducting audit of a corporate entity like company in addition to the above aspects even you need to verify the statutory compliances whether the entity is complying with the laws and regulations or not that also i have to verify so that is if i am conducting audit of a company i will verify even the compliance with the provisions of companies act also and finally after verifying all the principal after verifying all the above aspects audit will not get completed unless and until you express your opinion so the ultimate objective of audit is to express an opinion only no so the audit will not come to an end unless you express an opinion and how you are going to express that opinion when i say you have to express an opinion how you will express that opinion will you come before the audience take the mic and say i am giving a positive opinion will that be a proper expression of opinion or will you post a uh, will you do a tweet uh, in x or twitter uh, i am giving a positive opinion on so and so company if you tweet if you tweet it will that be enough or if you are uh, uploading a youtube video you have a youtube channel on that youtube channel you are uploading a video i have conducted audit of so and so company on that i am giving positive opinion will that be appropriate no so auditor has to express opinion and the proper form of expression of opinion is by giving it in a written format in the form of a written report we have to give so the ultimate objective of the auditor is to express an opinion that expression of opinion should not be just oral that expression of opinion should happen in a documented form and in a written format and the written document which contains the auditor's opinion that we are going to call it as audit report that we are going to call it as audit report nothing but simply audit report is a document which contains auditor's opinion unless and until the auditor gives the audit report audit will never get completed so that is what the last aspect of the audit which is reporting once you have covered all the principal aspects you are required to express your opinion in the form of a written document which we generally call it as audit report so these are all the principal aspects which are required to be covered in an audit very important repeatedly asked so if i do a quick revision first point accounting and internal controls in that also two things first obtain overall examination then perform in depth audit procedures and find out weakness number two arithmetical accuracy number three authenticity authenticity and validity of the transactions number four proper bifurcation proper bifurcation between capital and revenue expenditure number five uh, whether p whether incomes and expenses belong only to the current year or not number uh, number six we need to verify we need to verify whether financial statements are in agreement with the books of accounts or not number 7 we have to verify various items of the financial statements we have to verify assets also liabilities also incomes also expenses also number 8 in case if you are conducting audit of a corporate entity you need to even verify the compliance with the statutory laws and regulations also and finally you have to even give a report also so these are all the principal aspects which are required to be covered in an audit clear everybody comfortable till here so now we will go to the next concept now we will start revising the concept regarding scope of audit so what will be included in the scope of the audit what will not be included in the scope of the audit once again important question from the examination perspective so let us try to quickly revise it so what will be included in the scope of audit or they might also ask you a question write a short note on scope of audit so if you have been appointed as auditor of some entity as a part of your scope what and all will be included what you are supposed to do what you are not supposed to do what will fall in your scope what will not fall in your scope so that is what this question is about so let us say what does the answer say here let us see what does the answer say here number 1 the standard says as an auditor you have to cover all aspects of the organization which are related to the financial statements see when i say you are doing audit your scope is not just restricted to financial statements and books of accounts you just will not stick to the few pages of books of accounts and few documents of books a uh, few pages of the financial statements and few books of accounts so you as an auditor you are supposed to verify each and every part of the organization which is having a relationship with the financial statements if i give you example for example as an auditor you wanted to go and verify the inventory so at the warehouse the client is keeping some stock you want to go and physically verify the stock can the management say boss your scope is only financial statements and books of accounts we will not permit you to go to the premises and verify the stock can they say it no why because even that verification of inventory is also giving me evidence relating to one of the items of the financial statements so even that inventory verification also forms part of my scope why because it is related to financial statements so in this manner the auditor should the audit should be organized in such a manner all aspects related to the financial statements have to be covered as a part of your audit 
Number two, as a part of your audit, you need to verify whether the financial information is reliable or not. Sir, what do you mean by reliability? Trustability. So nothing but as an auditor, you are supposed to verify whatever financial information is there. We already know what is financial information, which is financial statements and books of accounts. So you need to verify whatever financial information is there, which is reliable or not. Doing that is also included in your scope. Sir, how I can verify whether the financial information is reliable or not, whether the financial statements and books of accounts are reliable or not, how will I, how will I come to know? So this point we have already seen in the principal aspects. Number one, you need to have a, you need to make a study of accounting system and internal control system. Number two, you need to carry out various other test inquiries and various other verification procedures. Sir, what are that test verifications and other verification procedures that we are actually try that actually we will try to cover in our subsequent chapters. So in our subsequent chapters, we will understand in a detailed manner what test we will do like inquiry, inspection, observation, re-performance. So what are that various test and verification procedure we need to perform to know that reliability of financial information that we will get to know in a later chapter called audit documentation and evidence. So for the time being now, for this particular question, you need to remember that as a part of scope, you need to verify even reliability of financial information. And for knowing the reliability of financial information, you are supposed to do two things. Number one, you need to make a study of accounting system and internal control system. And you need to carry out various, various other test and verification procedures which we will discuss later as a part of our subsequent chapters then as a part of your scope even you are required to verify even you are required to verify proper disclosures in the financial statements whatever disclosures which have been made in the financial statements be it in the form of balance sheet be it in the form of p and l be it in the form of notes to accounts whatever disclosures which are required in the financial statements whether there is a proper disclosures of all that is there in the financial statements or not that you need to verify sir how can i do it number one you have to compare the financial statements with underlying records nothing but whether the financial statements are matching with books of accounts or not if you remember this point we are coming across very repeatedly we have seen it in the points to be considered before expressing an opinion we have seen the same point even in the principal aspects also now they are telling this point once again in the scope also number two we need to consider whatever judgments which the management has made in the preparation of financial statements whether they are reasonable or not so the management while preparing financial file while preparing the financial statements they make use of various assumptions and estimates whether all that assumptions and estimates are reliable or not reasonable or not that also you have to verify Number three, you should also check accounting policies. What accounting policies your client has followed, whether they are consistently applied year after year or not, that also you need to verify. So these three activities will be, these broadly, these activities will be included in our scope. What are they? Our audit should cover all aspects related to the financial statements. We need to check the reliability of financial information. And also we need to check whether there is a proper disclosure in the financial statements. Now, they might also ask you a question, what will not be included in the audit? Sometimes instead of asking you the question, they might also alternatively ask what is not included in the auditor scope as a part of audit, what you are not supposed to do. That also they can ask you a question. Sir, how to answer that particular question? Here I have an example for you. So if they ask you the question, if they ask you only what is included in the scope, you will write the points whatever I have explained you till now. In case if they are alternatively asking the question, what is not included in the auditor scope, this is what you are supposed to write. First, you have to write that as an auditor, you are not supposed to do anything which is beyond your competence. If you are not competent, if you are not capable to do something that you are not supposed to do, that will not be forming part of your scope. I will give you one simple example. You are appointed as auditor of some entity. One day, the client's management came to you and asked, sir, we appointed as an auditor. You have to fight a case for me in the court of law. We have some uh, criminal case against one of our director. You have to fight the case for us. Are you supposed to do? No, because fighting a case is beyond your competence, beyond your capability. You are not supposed to do anything which is beyond your scope and competence. Or one more example. So you have been appointed as auditor of some company. One day the management is coming to you and asking, boss, you are appointed as an auditor. Our machinery has broken down. You have to come and fix our machinery. Will you go and do it? No. Why? Because that is beyond your competence, beyond your capability. So as an auditor, you are not supposed to perform any duty which is falling beyond your competence. Even if the management asks you to do something which is beyond your capabilities, you can straight away reject it. You are not under any obligation to do something which is beyond your scope and competence. Number two, an auditor is not an expert in the authentication of documents. Very important point, guys. And also, if you read this point further, the genuineness of the documents cannot be authenticated by him because he is not an expert in this field. 
which means take for example the management of the company brought to you some ownership document they are about to buying they are about to buy a property they are about to buy a property so some for example they are about to buy a piece of land they brought the legal documents to you they brought the legal documents to you and they are asking you to check whether those property documents whatever are there whether they are genuine or not that means on the basis of these documents whether they can purchase this property or not they are asking are you supposed to do it no why because we are not an expert in authentication we are not an expert in checking whether the transaction is genuine or not we are not some forensic investigators see whether a document is genuine or not whether a forgery has happened or not that is not something which in which we are experts with so we try to verify whether the evidence is convincing or not that's all we cannot we are not supposed to be an expert in authentication in determining genuinity of the documents that is a part of forensic we are not experts in that so in case if the client is asking you to check the check the genuineness of the documents whether a document is genuine or not signatures in the document are genuine or not is there any forgery are we supposed to do it no that is also beyond our competence we are not an expert in authentication of documents and also our audit is not an official investigation audit is different from investigation sir what is different what is the difference between audit and investigation see investigation is a special purpose assignment investigation investigation will always happen with a special purpose for example sometimes you are required to sometimes investigation will happen to find out only fraud sometimes investigations will be conducted by income tax authorities to find out the black money so investigation is a special assignment with a specific cause whereas audit is a general assignment where overall objective is to express an opinion so audit is a different from investigation when you are appointed as an auditor your responsibility is to do the audit not to do investigation investigation is going to be different audit is going to be different so that's what we have said here an audit is not an official investigation into alleged wrongdoing audit is different investigation is different so what is the difference here? investigation is a critical examination it is a in-depth examination of the accounts with a special purpose whereas the objective of the audit is to obtain reasonable assurance whether financial statements are free from material misstatements that is a general objective and express the opinion whereas investigation always happens with a special purpose and a specific purpose audit is different investigation is different understood everybody so if they in case if they ask you the question what is not included in the scope of audit this is what you are supposed to write three simple things auditor is not expected to perform duties which fall beyond his scope and competence auditor is not an expert in authentication of documents he cannot he cannot vouch for genuine uh, genuineness of the document number three audit is not an investigation into alleged wrongdoing and write this few points explaining the differences between audit and investigation so in case if they are asking you this question you are supposed to write this particular part of the answer so with this we are done with what the scope scope related concept also this we are done with what will be included what will not be included in the scope of audit so now let us try to proceed further and try to understand the remaining concepts here right okay so so now i will try to explain now we will try to revise this question number two what are the objectives of the auditor as per sa 200 see this answer we already know just a little bit elaboration that's it so as i have told you earlier in this chapter when i say i'm teaching you the chapter nature objective and scope of audit i'm in fact trying to teach you two standards which two standards i'm trying to teach you sa 200 and sa 210 sa 200 is the first and foremost standard on auditing like the way AS, when AS1 is the first and foremost standard on accounting, similarly, SA200 is the first and foremost standard on auditing. See, every standard will have an objective. Similarly, SA200 has also put some objectives on the auditor. So, let us see what are the objectives of the auditor as per SA200. So, SA200, the title of the standard, see, it is always advisable to remember the standard numbers and standard titles. This is one question which I often uh, uh often which i often get asked from the students sir am i required to remember the standard numbers am i required to remember the standard names if you remember it better it will uh, improve your presentation it is always advisable to do it but if you face any lot of difficulty significant difficulty in remembering you can ignore that also but i will suggest you even if you uh, do not remember the title of the standards fine but always try to remember which standard is talking about what concept that you have to remember standard numbers you re you remember so if you don't give reference to the name of the standard fine but you always try to give reference to the standard number that will be the 
and the, that will be the uh, good thing if you do it clear so sa 200 has also given certain objectives to the auditor sir what are that objectives so title of the standard is overall objectives of the independent auditor and conduct of an audit in accordance with standards on audit so in this standard the standard told that the overall objectives of the auditor are to obtain reasonable assurance regarding two things say 200 has given objectives and in that first objective they have told as an auditor you need to obtain reasonable assurance sir what is reasonable assurance we will talk about in a just a while first we will read the ignoring this reasonable assurance we will complete the objectives once we are done with understanding this particular answer once we complete reading this particular answer next we will take up a concept called inherent limitations there i will elaborate in a detailed manner what is this reasonable assurance okay so don't worry about it please focus so the objective of this standard is to uh, objective for the auditor is to obtain reasonable assurance about whether financial statements as a whole are free from material misstatements whether due to fraud or error and also the auditor is required to express an opinion whether financial statements are prepared in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework is there anything new here no there is nothing new here why because we have already understood these are two objectives in an elaborated manner when we took up the concept of introduction to audit so in the in the introduction to audit the same two objectives we have seen which sa 200 is also saying but it had it it has added one more term it is asking you to obtain reasonable assurance regarding two things for the time being you remember assurance as confidence reasonable means acceptable so as an auditor you are required to obtain reasonable assurance as an auditor you are required to obtain acceptable level of confidence you need to be having enough of confidence that financial statements are free from material misstatements and to express an opinion whether financial statements are prepared as per applicable financial reporting framework so obtaining that level of confidence is your objective regarding these two matters there is nothing new here we already know about these two matters in a detailed manner and also to report on the financial statements and communicate as required by the standards in accordance with the auditor's finding and during the course of audit you will have various findings whatever findings you have you are required to report and how to report all my findings is sir for every kind of finding there is a standard for example if you found a fraud how i have to report it there is a 240 about it sir i did i found some non compliances by my client entity what i should do i have to report it how you have to report it sa 250 is there sir i came to know some issue regarding going concern how i have to report you have to report it as per sa 570 so whatever your findings are that during the course of audit you might come across various findings relating to the audit all those findings you are required to report and how to report sir as per the relevant standards so this is what the objectives which are given to the auditor as per sa 200 as per sa 200 so this is what you have to write in case if they ask you the uh in, in case if they ask you to write about what are the objectives of auditor as per sa 200 now we will revise one of the most important concept on this entire subject in this entire topic uh which is having high chance of getting tested in the examination which has been repeatedly tested in the examination which is inherent limitations which is what inherent limitations sir what is this concept of inherent limitations i will try to simplify it in a simple manner see no matter how effectively you do the audit no matter how effectively you do the audit there is always a chance of auditor's opinion going wrong no matter how effectively you do the audit there is always a chance of auditor's opinion going wrong because the process of auditing is suffering from some limitations and those limitations are of such a nature that they are unavoidable what is the nature of that limitations they are unavoidable in nature and those limitations we call them as inherent limitations inherent means something which is unavoidable so the point which i'm trying to say is no matter how effectively you do the audit there is always a chance of auditor's opinion going wrong because the process of auditing is suffering from some limitations which are of such a nature you can't avoid them no matter whatever you do those limitations we call them as inherent limitations of audit i will tell you one simple example see take for example you are supposed to do audit of reliance industries limited you are supposed to do audit of reliance industries limited or let us take the practical case reliance industries limited is there one of the biggest conglomerate of india for that also audit will happen so take for example for the financial year 22 23 audit of reliance industries limited would have happened yes it has happened sir within how many days the audit of reliance industries limited will be completed the audit of reliance industries limited will be completed in a span of 30 days and if you take companies like Infosys, TCS, even for these companies also audit will happen. 
and if you check their audit reports infosys audit report will be there on or before 15th of april that means hardly within 15 to 20 days audit of these companies are getting completed so reliance industries limited auditor will take 30 days to complete the audit infosys auditor will take 15 days to complete the audit tcs auditor will take 15 days to complete the audit so just imagine how big these companies are but the auditors are able to complete the audit of these so called bigger companies just in a span of 15 days 20 days 30 days how do you think that is possible that is possible because auditors will not verify 100% of the transactions auditors will verify sampling auditors will verify the transactions on sampling basis sir why auditor will verify transactions on sampling basis why because just imagine in case of reliance industries limited which is having 6 lakh plus crores of turnover of the company 10 lakh plus of employees if i have to do audit of this reliance industries limited by verifying 100 percent transactions it will take easily three four years for me to do the audit so we can't afford to spend such amount of time on audit so audit has to be completed within reasonable time audit has to be completed within reasonable cost and sometimes 100 percent verification becomes impossible also sometimes 100 percent verification becomes impossible so that's why what practically auditors will do is auditors will try to verify the transactions on sampling basis for example in the entire reliance industries limited audit the auditors verified only 10 percent of the transactions sir is it permitted by the standards yes the auditors are permitted to verify the transactions on sampling basis even standards on auditing itself is giving you the permission okay reliance industries limited auditor has verified the transactions of only 10 percent and on the basis of that he has expressed an opinion but if you observe carefully here if the auditor has verified the transactions on sampling basis if he's saying i have verified 10 percent of the sample indirectly he's very indirectly he's saying he did not verify 90 percent of the transactions in the 90 percent of the transactions which he did not verify there could be fraud also there could be error also since you did not verify this 90 percent of the transactions you will not be able to find out the fraud also you will not be able to find out the error also which is there in that 90 percent of the transactions because of that your opinion can go wrong or not yes so no matter how effectively you do the audit you are there is always a chance of auditors opinion going wrong sir in this particular example what is the reason for my opinion going wrong because i am verifying the transactions on sampling basis i am verifying the transactions on sampling basis this is a limitation this is a what limitation i have to do the audit on sampling basis only then only i will be able to complete the audit sir can i avoid this limitation what do you mean by avoiding the limitation avoiding the limitation means don't verify the transactions on sampling basis verify 100 percent of the transactions do you think it is possible looking at the size of the so-called companies looking at the volume of transactions nowadays the companies are doing 100 percent verification is close to impossible so that's why we are verifying the transactions on sampling basis but that is limitation we can't avoid it we have to verify the transactions on sampling basis only so verification of transactions on sampling basis is such a limitation of audit which can't be avoided but if you verify the transactions on sampling basis there is always a possibility of auditor's opinion going wrong so can i say sampling has inherent limitation yes the process of audit is suffering from limitation which is of such a nature we can't avoid it so that's why we can call verification of transactions on sampling basis is an inherent limitation so like this this is not the only limitation there are various other limitations because of which no matter how effectively you do the audit there is always a possibility of your opinion going wrong one such, one such example i have given is audit sampling but uh, but that is not the only limitation there are various other limitations also which you can't avoid it no matter whatever you do that limitations we call them as inherent limitations let us see what are those inherent limitations of audit but before i talk about what are those inherent limitations let me try to explain what is the impact of inherent limitations because of inherent limitations what will happen number one as i have told because of inherent limitations there is always a possibility of auditors opinion going wrong because of or because of inherent limitations there is always a possibility of auditors opinion going wrong there might be a chance that your opinion can go wrong number two because of inherent limitations there will always be a audit risk audit risk can never be eliminated it can only be reduced sir what is audit risk nothing but audit risk means nothing but chance of auditor's opinion going wrong so you can never ever eliminate the audit risk eliminating audit risk means you are coming and saying i have done the audit and uh, i am damn sure that my opinion will not go wrong can you give that guarantee no so that is what the meaning audit risk can never be eliminated to zero it can be reduced but it can never be eliminated third implication because of this reason only we always say auditor will express opinion but not guarantee 
so till now whenever we have seen the objectives of audit i was always telling auditor will give only opinion never ever have i told auditor will auditor will give guarantee sir why you did not say auditor will give guarantee because he can't why he can't give guarantee why he can only express opinion why because there are inherent limitations number four one more implication of inherent limitation auditor can obtain only reasonable assurance but not absolute assurance auditor can only obtain reasonable assurance but not absolute assurance sir what is reasonable assurance they say reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance but not absolute assurance so in order to understand what is reasonable assurance first we need to know what is reasonable assurance what is absolute assurance sorry so if you see yeah this is what the definition they have given reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance but not absolute assurance so in, to understand what is reasonable assurance first we need to understand what is absolute assurance assurance as i have told confident uh, absolute means absolute means what 100% 100% confident so absolute assurance means giving guarantee absolute assurance means what equal to giving guarantee so in audit the standards are expecting even if you remember in sa 200 we have seen they are only asking us sa 200 is only asking auditor to obtain reasonable assurance even sa 200 is not expecting the auditor to obtain absolute assurance sir why even sa 200 is not expecting the auditor to get to be 100 percent confident because he can't do it why he can't obtain absolute assurance why he can only obtain reasonable assurance because of inherent limitations so because of these reasons the standard sa 200 has told dear auditor you try to obtain high level of assurance but we are not expecting from you absolute assurance absolute assurance means giving guarantee sa 200 itself told we don't want guarantee from you sir why you don't want guarantee why the standards are only expecting reasonable assurance the logic is very simple the process of audit is suffering from some limitations which are unavoidable which we call them as inherent limitations so this is what the impact of inherent limitations so four impact guys number one auditor can obtain only reasonable assurance but not absolute assurance the auditor can express opinion but not guarantee there is always a possibility of auditor's opinion going wrong the auditors can never be eliminated so we have seen impact let us try to understand what are that inherent limitations what are those limitations which can't be avoided number one nature of financial reporting See, financial reporting, as we have already seen earlier, it means the process of preparation and presentation of financial statements. Now they are telling, ignore the audit, the process of financial reporting, the process of accounting itself is suffering from some limitation. Sir, what is the limitation which accounting process is suffering from? Accounting process is suffering from some limitation, which is usage of estimates. We all know that the management will prepare financial statements by making use of some estimates. Take for example depreciation. In calculation of depreciation in this formula cost minus residual value divided by useful life. In this formula cost is only the thing which we know with accuracy. Reliable, residual value is an estimate. Useful life is also an estimate. Provision for bad and doubtful debts. Estimate. Provision for expenses. Estimate. So like this in the preparation of financial statements management might make use of so many estimations which involve uncertainty. See, when we say estimate, that estimate can go wrong also. For example, management created a provision for bad and doubtful debts. They are required to collect 1 crore rupees of money from the debtor. And the financial position of the debtor is very bad. And management thought that not even a single rupee is recoverable from him. So what they have done is provision for bad and doubtful debts. 1 crore they have created. Provision for bad and doubtful debts. 1 crore expense they have created. So profit will reduce by 1 crore. As an auditor, I felt, yes, provision for bad and doubtful debts, this estimate of 1 crore provision is correct only, I gave a positive opinion. But in the next year, what happened is, all of a sudden, this uh, debtor's position has become very good, he repaid us back entire 1 crore rupee. That means last year we have created a wrong provision. And last year I have audited, I thought revision, I, th I thought that provision is correct and I gave the opinion. But in the current year, that estimation has gone wrong. If the estimation has gone wrong, financial statements has also gone wrong. If the financial statements has gone wrong, auditor's opinion has also gone wrong. Able to understand what I'm trying to say? So first inherent limitation is nature of financial reporting. That means the process of accounting itself is suffering from some limitation, which is management will make use of assumptions, estimates, which involve uncertainty. These estimates can go wrong in the future. And when these estimates go wrong in the future, financial statements also will go wrong. When the financial statements goes wrong, auditor's opinion also can go wrong. Can we avoid this limitation? Avoiding this limitation means what? Preparing the financial statements without using a single assumption. Do you think it is possible? No, it is not going to be possible. Understood everybody? So that is what the first inherent limitation, nature of financial reporting. 
clear everybody and also one more category also they say here see generally we do audit on the assumption that management will implement internal controls but what could happen is those internal controls also might not function effectively we we will generally assume that internal controls in the client organization will work very well we generally have that presumption but what could happen is internal controls might not work that effectively as we thought so when internal controls don't work properly frauds and errors also will not be prevented and we will not be able to detect it and obviously our opinion also will go wrong so that what they have added one more point here so first the main explanation here is the process of financial statements involve usage of estimates because of which auditors opinion can go wrong and one more thing we generally do the audit with the assumption that management will implement internal controls but that internal controls might not function effectively which can make the misstatement to still happen which can't be identified by the auditor clear so that is what the first category of inherent limitation second one nature of audit procedures now first inherent limitation they told the process of accounting is suffering from some limitation now in the second point they are telling the process of audit itself is suffering from some limitation the process of audit is also suffering from some limitation sir what is the process of or what limitation the process of audit is suffering from see the thing is sometimes auditor will not be able to obtain audit evidence because of practical and legal limitations see generally the entire process of audit is first auditor will perform audit procedures by performing that audit procedures auditor will get something called audit evidence on the basis of that evidence auditor will express opinion then the process of audit will generally come to an end so generally auditor will perform audit procedures to obtain audit evidence but in some cases what will happen is there will be certain practical and legal limitations because of which auditor will not be able to obtain audit evidence and if you express opinion without obtaining audit evidence definitely there is a chance of that opinion going wrong for sure it will happen right sir what is the what are those limitations associated with audit procedures one thing we have already covered sampling auditor will verify the transactions on sampling when you are verifying transactions on sampling obviously there is a chance of your opinion going wrong number two sometimes management themselves will not provide you with the required information either intentionally or unintentionally see in order to get the audit evidence we take the help of management information by the end of the day has to be provided by management only but sometimes management themselves will not provide you with the required information either intentionally or unintentionally then also you will not obtain evidence number three sophisticated frauds which means see generally the person whoever is committing a fraud definitely is doing something wrong but always the person committing a fraud will be a bit intelligent See, I'm not giving you any motivation for you to go and commit the frauds, but I'm telling the fact. Generally, the person whoever commits a fraud will be a little bit intelligent. If he is too intelligent, no, he will commit fraud in such a manner that no one will even get a suspicion that fraud has been committed. So he will create false documents. He will destroy the existing documents. He will uh, make so many adjustments. He will control so many people and he will pretend as if no fraud has taken it, taken place. And if such an intelligent person has committed a fraud in a sophisticated manner, no matter how effectively you do the audit, there will always be a chance of not identifying that fraud. Take for example, Punjab National Bank case. In the PNB case, there is somewhere around 13,000 crores worth of fraud. And this fraud did not happen just in one year. The fraud has taken a span of eight years to accumulate that much value. So, uh, sir, sir, but the fraud was identified in the eighth year. That means in the seven years, auditors were not able to identify the fraud. Sir, is it auditor's mistake? No. Why? Because in that case, the fraud was carried out in a sophisticated manner. Different people in the organization are involved. One third party, one top level management, one middle level manager, one low level clerk. Like this, different people in the organization colluded with each other and are able to manipulate in such a manner that no matter how hard the auditor puts the effort, he is still unable to detect it. So like this, because of sophisticated fraud also, auditor might not be able to identify it because of that also auditor's opinion can go wrong. Number four, related party transaction. Sometimes your client will enter into related party transaction, like a transaction between holding and subsidiary. See, the problem with the related party transaction is since both the parties are related, they can manipulate the terms and conditions. On paper, the transaction will look correct only, but we will never know the actual intentions in the case of related parties. So if there is any collusion, if there is any fraud which is getting committed through the related party, it is very much difficult to be, it is, it is very much difficult for the auditor to detect it. And in most of the cases, auditor will not be able to detect the related party frauds. Why? Because they're both the parties are closely related with each other. They can do, they can manipulate the terms, they can collude and 
put and together they, they can cheat the auditor so that's why when there are related party transactions and because of that any fraud is happening that is also difficult for the auditor to find it out so second category of inherent limitation nature of audit procedures in that four examples they have given number one sampling number two management themselves will not provide complete information number three fraud will be carried out in a sophisticated manner number four related party transactions third category of uh, limitation audit is not in the nature of investigation i have already told you this see audit is different investigation is different in the case of official investigation, the person will have a lot of powers. Take for example, income tax right. See, in the income tax right, if you carefully observe, what will happen in the income tax right? A group of professional people will come and do, uh, and will do certain things which we don't expect from the professionals. Like they will break the walls, they will break the ceilings. That is their duty, agreed. See, in the case of investigation, the person doing investigation will have superior powers. They can break the walls, they can stop the communication, they can stop the movement of the people. If since the investigators, since the investigators are having supreme powers, they can get more information, they can get absolute assurance. But as auditor, we are not official investigators. We don't get all that powers. We can't go and break the walls. We can't go and break the ceilings. We can't stop the communication. We can't uh, uh, stop the movement of the people. If we do all these things, no, uh, if, if you do all these things, uh, the client will give a tight slap and throw you out of the company. So audit is different, investigator is different. Like or like investigator, we auditors will not have supreme powers because of which we always uh, rely only on convincing evidence. We never get conclusive evidence because of which also auditor's opinion can go wrong. Number four, timeliness of financial reporting and decrease in the relevance of information. This I will tell you in a simple way. I will try to example. See, sometimes what will happen is, take for example, I have done audit of one client X Limited for the financial year 2021-22. Well, I am doing the audit of the financial year of 21-22 of the client X Limited. I performed in-depth audit procedures and I obtained a lot of evidences. Okay. Now, the same client appointed me as an auditor for the financial year 22-23 also. Now, in some cases, standards will give you permission that because of timeliness of, uh, since you have to complete the audit within time, <coughs> the standards have given permission. Sometimes you can use the evidence which you have obtained from the previous years in the current year's audit. Some evidence regarding internal controls and all. Like that, if you have done the last year's audit also, in the current year's audit, in some cases, you can use the evidence which, is, which you have obtained in the previous year. You can use that information. And some auditors will do it. Standards also permit it. But by doing that also, there is a chance of your opinion going wrong. Why? Because... Since there is a time gap between the time at which you have obtained the evidence and whenever you are using it. There is a time gap between the, there is a time actually, there is a, there is a lot of time that has lapsed between the time you got the evidence and when you are using it. In case if you are using last year's information, last year you have obtained and you are using that information in the current year. Because of that, the relevance of that information will come down or not. I will give you one simple logic here. In the year 21-22, you thought of buying a car. You thought of buying a car. You did a lot of analysis, you obtained a lot of information, what is the latest features in the market and all, and you decided in the last year, according to you, so some Tata Motors is the premium car, that is the suitable car for you. But you did not buy it. Now in the year 20 to 23, you want to buy a car once again. Can you use the analysis, whatever you have made in the year 21, 22 to buy the car in the year 20 to 23? Yes, you can use it. But in between this one year, there might be new features which are available in the market. So you can use it, but since there is a time gap between the, since there is a lapse of time between the time you have obtained the information and you are using it for decision making purposes, sometimes because of this your decision might go wrong. Might be in this one year some new features have come in the market which you are not aware and using the last year's information only you have bought a wrong car. So no, the same thing can happen even in the audit also. Sometimes you use last year's information for the current year's audit. But since there is a time gap, the relevance of the information may come down because of which your opinion might go wrong. So that is what the simple summary of that point. You can refer this example that will give you better understanding. So that is what the fourth point, decrease in the relevance of information. And number five, future events. Our opinion can always go wrong because of future events. Why? Because we don't have control over future events. Like for example, in the year 22-23, as on the balance sheet date, I thought going concern assumption is valid. Entity will continue for the foreseeable future. Management told going concern is valid. I also felt going concern is valid. I gave a positive opinion. But within six months, some unavoidable circumstances, some huge fire accident happened, 70% of the factory burnt and they don't have insurance policy. The factory got closed down. Now the going concern all of a sudden has become invalid. That means my opinion has gone wrong. 
Is it my mistake? No. Why? Because my opinion has gone wrong because of some future event over which I don't have control. So like this, even because of future events also, my opinion can go wrong because of which I am not the responsible person. Uh, for, and for that and if my opinion has gone wrong because of future events definitely i am not the i am not the one who is responsible for my wrong opinion it is limitation of the audit itself it is unavoidable i can't avoid that limitation the process of audit itself is suffering from some limitation so these are the inherent limitations clear everybody very important question they might ask you only one part of the question instead of asking you entire inherent limitations they might ask you only one part like they might ask you write about nature of financial reporting as an inherent limitation or they might ask you nature of audit procedures as an inherent limitation you should be able to write the significant uh, portion of that answer clear so what are inherent limitations very important i will quickly revise once again number of number one nature of financial reporting Number two, nature of audit procedures. In that also various categories are there. Sampling, management themselves are not providing information, sophisticated frauds and related party transactions. Number three, audit is not in the nature of investigation. Number four, decrease in the relevance of information over time. Number five, future events. So these are the various these are the various limitations because of which there is always a possibility of auditor's opinion going wrong. Till here, comfortable everybody? So with this we are done with the inherent limitations now let us proceed further with the revision of the remaining concepts from this particular chapter so till now whatever concepts we have understood whatever concepts we have revised from this chapter majorly they are from essay 200 so whatever content we have revised from this chapter till now like types of order principal aspects scope of order what is included what is not included what are inherent limitations so all this content whatever we have discussed till now majorly it has been taken from standard on audit essay 200 now there are few more concepts which are there in this particular chapter let us try to revise them so the next concept which i am going to revise is relating to something called ethical requirements the next concept which we are going to revise is what ethical requirements see we auditors play a very crucial role so depending on our opinion there are so many people who are going to base their economic decision like if you take a listed company like Reliance Industries Limited, the auditors of this Reliance Industries Limited conduct the audit, give their auditor's opinion. That auditor's opinion will form the basis for so many shareholders' decision, whether they have to stay invested in the company or they have to quit from the investment or they have to add extra investment. Or if you take the case of a banker, the banker is going to rely on the audited financial statements to decide whether to give a loan to a company or not. So like that, being an auditor, once we express an opinion, that opinion is going to be used by so many people. And so many different kinds of stakeholders are going to base their economic decisions on the basis of our auditor's opinion. So as an auditor, we are playing a very crucial role in the decision making process of the various stakeholders, especially they base their economic decisions, financial decisions on the basis of what opinion we are giving. So that's why since our opinion is forming the basis for so many people's actions, there is a requirement of ethical requirements. As an auditor, we are supposed to follow some ethical requirements. Ethical requirements means you can say some moral values we are supposed to follow. So as per the standards on auditing, an auditor is required to comply with five ethical requirements how many ethical requirements guys the auditor is required to comply with five ethical requirements sir what are that five ethical requirements which every auditor must comply with number one is integrity number two we have objectivity number three confidentiality number four professional competence and due care and number five we have professional behavior professional behavior so being an auditor, we are supposed to comply with these five ethical requirements. Name the five ethical requirements, guys. Number one, integrity. Number two, objectivity. Number three, confidentiality, professional competence and due care and professional behavior. Sir, what are all these five ethical requirements? If we try to understand it in a detailed manner, integrity means being honest being sincere being straightforward as an auditor, you should not associate yourself with such a documents which you believe it to be false. If you know some document is uh, false, you should not associate yourself with those kind of documents. So that honesty, that sincerity, that straightforwardness of an auditor that we call it as integrity. And as an auditor, you must have that integrity. 
Number two, objectivity. Sir, what is the meaning of objectivity? Very simple. You should not have any kind of bias. You should not show any favorism. You should not let any any persons influence your decision. You should behave in an unbiased manner. So that ability to act in an unbiased manner, not getting influenced by others, that we call it as objectivity. More or less, objectivity, independence, both convey same meaning. So second ethical requirement which auditor must possess is objectivity. Third one, confidentiality. See, being an auditor, you will be in some superior position. During the course of audit, you will get a lot of information regarding client's business. Sometimes you will also acquire some confidential information also. Now, being an auditor, you have been given that power to get any information which you required for the purpose of your for the purpose of conducting the audit. There is also a responsibility to maintain the confidentiality. So, whatever information you are acquiring from the client, you should not disclose that information to anybody else, other uh, unless you have obtained the client's permission. So, that confidentiality you have to maintain, secrecy over the client's information you have to maintain. However, if there is any legal or regulatory requirement, then you have to disclose. Then you should not say, no, no, I have to maintain confidentiality. I will not disclose the information even to the regulatory authorities also. That things will not work there. Unless there is any legal or regulatory requirement, you should not be disclosing the client's information to any outsider. So that confidentiality you have to maintain. Sir, why this requirement? As I have told, being an auditor, you enjoy that privilege. You get whatever information you want regarding the client's business. Client will never say no. But when you are getting that information, you have to be responsible for that. You have to maintain confidentiality. You have to maintain secrecy over that client's information. Then next, uh, next ethical requirement, which is professional competence and due care. Sir, what is professional competence? Competence means what? Capability. See, as we all know, being an auditor, we deal with such a subjects which are tend to change over a period of time like every year for every year when the budget comes there will be some changes in the income tax act there will be changes in the indirect taxes sometimes uh, all together old laws will be scrapped and new laws will be brought in like companies act 1956 was scrapped and companies act 2013 was brought so so many circulars will come so many notifications will come so many guidance notes will come so like that being an being a chartered accountant we deal with such a subjects which will not remain constant which will change continuously now if you have to provide a relevant services to your client don't you think you have to remain updated with all the recent things happening in our subjects yes so that is what the meaning of professional competence you have to be competent enough you have to become capable so that whatever services you are providing to the client that is relevant that is not outdated service so that is your moral response moral responsibility since your opinion is getting used by so many people you have to remain professionally competent you have to remain professionally capable person you have to maintain you have to update your knowledge you have to update your skills and also you have to maintain due care that means you have to do the audit with utmost care and responsibility you should not do any kind of assignment carelessly you have to do the assignment in such a careful manner which we generally call it as diligence diligence means you have to do the audit with utmost care so that is one more ethical requirement you have to be professionally competent and also you have to maintain due care and finally professional behavior which means whatever work you are trying to do that work should comply with laws and regulations and being a chartered accountant don't do any such work which will bring a discredit to the profession which will bring a bad name to the profession that kind of work you should not do should always do the work which complies with the laws and regulations so these are the five ethical requirements which every auditor must comply with what are the five ethical requirements guys very important from the examination perspective the five ethical requirements are integrity objectivity confidentiality professional competence and due you care and also professional behavior understood everybody now now we will also try to elaborate on the concept of independence so we have already seen what is the meaning of the term independence sir what is the meaning of the term independence so if i tell you what is the meaning of the term independence so here we have here so independence implies that the judgment of a person is not subordinate to the wishes or directions of another person who might have engaged him this point i have already revised when i took up the chapter introduction so what is the meaning of the term independence independence means you should take decision in such a manner that or your decision should not change judgment of a person it is not subordinate that means the decisions made by the person should not be changed according to the wishes and directions of the other persons that ability to take the decision without giving importance to other persons wishes and directions that characteristic we call it as independence that characteristic we are going to call it as what independence and also 
I have told audit of de uh, definition of audit itself says audit is an independent examination. So in audit, whatever examination we are doing, that is completely an independent examination. And also at one point I have explained this independence can be divided into two categories. Independence will be of two types. Number one is independence of mind and the other one is independence of appearance this also i have explained while i was explaining while i was explaining about various types of audit i elaborated on this concept of what is independence of mind what is independence of appearance what is independence of mind the act the agreement of mind the decision the agreement which you have made in your mind to act independently that we call it as independence of mind sir what is independence of appearance not having any relationship or association with the client that we call it as independence of appearance now, when it comes to this concept of independence, there is one important question which is very frequently tested in the examination. What are various threats to independence? What are various threats to independence? See, there is a global organization called IFAC, International Federation for Accountants. Like this, there is one global organization. This global organization has identified five kinds of threats to independence. See, when I say something as a threat to independence, what do I mean by that? If I'm telling a circumstance as a threat to independence, what do I mean by that? Because of that circumstance, is independence is going to get increased or independence is going to get compromised or reduced? So when I say something as a threat to independence, which means because of that factor, because of that circumstances, there is a danger of independence getting compromised. There's a danger of independence getting reduced. So like that, IFAC has identified how many kinds of threats? Five kinds of threats they have identified. Sir, what are that five kinds of threats, sir? So what are that five kinds of threats? So if we see here, the five kinds of threats are, so if you see here, the five kinds of threats are, number one, you have to, uh, number one, self-interest threats. Number two, self-review threats. Number three, advocacy threats. Number four, familiarity threats. And number five, intimidation threats. So what are the five kinds of threats which are identified by whom? IFAC. Five kinds of threats they have identified which are self-interest threat, self-review threat, advocacy threat, familiarity threat and intimidation threat. Let me try to revise in a brief what is exactly each of this threat. First, let us talk about self-interest threat. Sir, what is self-interest threat? Self-interest threat occurs when the auditor is getting some financial benefit or when the auditor is financially interested in the client for which he is doing the audit. Like for example, auditor is holding shares in the company, auditor has given loan to the company or auditor has taken loan from the company. He's having some close business relationship. So when the auditor is getting benefited because of a financial interest in the client company, that kind of threats we do call it as self-interest threat. So then what is self-review threat? The name itself says, as an auditor, you are reviewing your own work, which you have done as a part of previous assignment. As an auditor, if you are reviewing your own work as a part, which uh, you are reviewing your own work, which you have done as a part of previous assignment, that threat we call it as self-review threat. Sir, when does that happen? Take for example, I am a chartered accountant. Recently, I have been a director of the company X Limited. For the entire year, I have been acted as a director of the company X Limited. At certain point of time, I retired as a director. Now, this company is looking for appointment as an auditor. They went to the same chartered accountant who was their director and told him, boss, you do the company audit for us. So, whatever whoever person who has been a director in the company, the same person has been appointed as auditor. See, as an auditor, you are supposed to verify financial statements and books of accounts. But earlier, you were a director. Being a director, you have already involved in the preparation of financial statements and books of accounts. So as a director, you have performed the work of preparation of financial statements and books of accounts. As an auditor, you are supposed to review the same financial statements and books of accounts which are prepared by yourself. That means you are reviewing your own work, which is a self-review threat. Basically, you are evaluating your own answer sheet. See, if you evaluate your own answer sheet, can we call that as independent evaluation? Definitely not. So that is when self-review threat will occur when the auditor is reviewing his own work, which, is, which has been performed as a part of previous assignment. So in those circumstances, self-review threat will happen. Then we have something called advocacy threat. Sir, what is advocacy threat? Advocacy threat occurs when the auditor supports the client's opinion without any reasonable basis. When does advocacy threat occur? When the auditor supports the client's opinion without any reasonable basis. If I give you an example, take for example, there is some company X Limited. This company X Limited is having a case pending before income tax department. And this company has appointed one practicing chartered accountant to fight the case. 
they did not appoint as audit auditor initially they have appointed this practicing chartered accountant to fight the case on behalf of this client company x limited that means that this company is expecting this practicing chartered accountant to support this company and win the case before income tax department now what the client is doing is the same practicing chartered accountant they want to appoint as an auditor the same practicing chartered accountant whom they have appointed as an advocate to fight the income tax department the same person if they are appointing as an auditor here advocacy threat will occur sir how come advocacy threat will occur why because here auditor is in two conflicting positions here practicing chartered accountant is in two conflicting positions see when the client has appointed you as an advocate what is your duty you have to support the client's mistake see what lawyers will do for their clients even though they know that their client has done a mistake they will try to support the client's mistakes no to make the to make their clients win the case here also when they have appointed this practicing chartered accountant as an advocate he will support the client's mistakes and he will try to defend the client against the income tax department now if the same person is appointed as auditor of the same company now he has to report his findings he has to report the mistakes so as an advocate you are supporting the mistakes as an as an auditor you have to you have to identify and report the mistakes in one position you have to defend the client in one position you have to offend the client both are two conflicting positions at certain point of time uh, con at a certain point of time independence will be compromised or not now in one case he is supporting before income tax department my client is honest person my client did not do any fraud now as an auditor you have to comment yes my client has done a fraud so both are two conflicting positions he has to uh, conflict his own statement so definitely independence will get compromised there so these kind of threats we call them as advocacy threats so generally advocacy threats occur when the auditor supports the client's opinion without any reasonable basis so we have seen three kinds of threats self-interest self-review advocacy then we have familiarity threats sir when the familiarity threats will occur familiarity threats will occur when the auditor is having a close personal relationship with the client so you are too familiar with the client personally you are familiar with the client like how sir for example you are a practicing chartered accountant your brother is in some top level management your brother is a director of a company your father is a cfo or you and the client they, you are having some long standing relationship from the last 10 years you are you are you are acting as an auditor of the same company so like this when you have a close personal association with the client for whom you are doing audit you become very familiar you generate sympathy towards the clients because of that also there is a possibility of independence getting compromised those threats we call them as familiarity threats and finally we have something called intimidation threats intimidation threats occur when the auditor is prevented from acting independently intimidation means a threatening auditor wants to act independently but the client is threatening he is blackmailing for example the client is telling, uh, the client is going to the auditor and telling, sir, did you do the audit? Yes. They have asked the auditor, did you find any misstatement? The auditor told yes. Sir, which opinion you will give? Auditor is telling, I will definitely give negative opinion. Now the management of the client is telling, if you give negative opinion, you will not go back to home. If you give negative opinion, your wife will not return from office. So threatening, that means the auditor wants to act independently, but the client is preventing him from acting independently by intimidation, by threatening, that we call it as intimidation threats. So these are the five kinds of threats which are identified by a global organization called IFAC. So what are the five kinds of threats? Self-interest, self-review, advocacy, familiarity and intimidation threats. Clear everybody? Able to understand? Next. Now safeguards to independence there is one small uh, and one more thing guys when you are preparing for this uh, particular question threats to independence the most important thing is please do refer to these examples so i suggest you refer these examples repeatedly why because they might pose a question as a uh, case scenario based mcq they will give you a scenario and say uh, this will fall under which kind of threat so mostly they will try to choose the questions from these examples whatever they have given so my humble suggestion my humble request each and every student compulsorily you have to go through these uh, uh, points or examples whatever have been given for each threat that is very very important from their true or false statements and case scenario based mcqs have a high chance of getting tested okay so now let us proceed further so we have understood what is the meaning of the term independence we have understood what are the various types of independence we have also understood what are various threats to independence now let us try to understand what are various safeguards to independence that means how can you safeguard your independence how can you protect your independence how can you protect your independence as an auditor what steps you can take to protect your independence very simple guys you have to apply the common sense see before you accept the audit before you accept the audit then only you have to analyze is there any threat to my independence 
for example there is a there is a practicing chartered accountant one day a client tax limited has came to him and asked him sir you please do the audit for us before you say yes to that client analyze if you accept this audit is there any threat is there any self interest is there any self review is there any advocacy threat is there any familiarity threat is there any intimidation threat try to analyze so before accepting audit only you start analyzing for this if you did not find any threat if you did not find any threat what you do happily go and accept however before accepting the audit only you came to know that there are certain threats what you will try to do take some precautionary measures to eliminate that threat analyze can you do something to eliminate that threat if you could eliminate that threat eliminate it then accept the audit if you are unable to eliminate the threat to independence don't accept the audit only if you are unable to eliminate that threat don't accept the audit only so how you can safeguard the independence is before accepting the audit analyze are there any threats to independence yes they are there then try to take some precautionary measures to eliminate that threat if you are able to eliminate that threat happily go and accept the audit if you are unable to eliminate the threat don't accept the audit at all see sometimes what will happen is before i accept the audit there are no threats but after i have accepted the audit then i come across any of the threats to independence at the time of before accept before accepting the audit i did not have any threat so i have accepted but after i have accepted the audit i have come across any of the five threats then what i should do here also same steps if after accepting the audit if you have come across any of the five threats take precautionary measures to eliminate that threat analyze can you do something to eliminate that threat if you are able to eliminate that threat happily continue the audit if you are unable to eliminate that threat what you do is withdraw from the audit altogether don't continue doing the audit withdraw able to understand very simple guys you have to apply the common sense that's all nothing else before accepting the audit analyze for threats if there are any take precautionary measures to eliminate if you are able to eliminate accept it if you are unable to eliminate it don't accept it sometimes what will happen is after you have accepted the audit then you will come across a threat then what you should do same steps uh, analyze uh, will you be able to do something to eliminate them if you are able to eliminate yes continue the audit if you are unable to eliminate it withdraw from the audit that's all so these are all the various safeguards to independence so we have seen meaning of independence types of independence threats to independence and even we have seen what are the various safeguards to independence comfortable everybody till here no. so now what we will do is we will try to understand one more important concept professional skepticism we'll try to understand one more important concept professional skepticism so professional skepticism is one of the important quality which every auditor must possess professional skepticism is one of the important quality which every auditor must possess sir what is the meaning of professional uh, what is the meaning of professional skepticism so as per the standard professional skepticism involves three components a b c i generally say a b c of professional skepticism so professional when i say professional skepticism it involves three components sir what are that three components a stands for attitude of questioning mind being an auditor you should not blindly accept anything you should always have a questioning mind b for being alert to unusual circumstances if you find any unusual circumstances if you find something other than usual if you find something suspicious you have to remain alert to it and c for critical assessment of audit evidence whatever audit evidence you are gathering you have to critically analyze that audit evidence so when i say professional skepticism it involves three components maintaining an attitude of questioning mind being alert to unusual circumstances critical assessment of audit evidence see attitude of questioning mind very simple to understand so don't accept anything whatever client says blindly try to question it sir we have to remain alert to unusual circumstances if at all you come across any unusual circumstances to that you have to remain alert you should not take them lightly you have to remain alert sir are there any examples of unusual transactions to which auditor should remain alert yes there are some examples of unusual transactions to which auditor should remain alert number 1 when there is a conflict between multiple audit evidences for example for a same item of financial statement you have evidence from two sources when both the evidences are relating to same item they should match with each other if they are conflicting with each other see for example if you want to obtain evidence regarding debtors you have obtained evidence by doing inspection by doing verification of books of accounts you also obtain audit evidence by asking a confirmation from the debtor see both the evidences are trying to support same item now when both are trying to support same item they both should match with each other but from inspection i got something else from external confirmation i got something else so multiple evidences regarding same item are not matching there are conflicts this is one example of unusual circumstance to which you should remain alert conflicts between multiple audit evidences or if you come across situation of possible fraud 
if you came to know because of some situation there is a possibility of happening of fraud to that situation also you have to remain alert and when you have doubts regarding reliability of audit evidence when you have questions regarding trustability of audit evidence when you have something suspicion about the audit evidence to that circumstances also you have to remain alert so second component of professional skepticism you should be alert to unusual circumstances and here they have given a few examples of unusual circumstances to which you have to remain alert what are they so you have to if you find any conflicts between multiple audit evidences if you find any situation of possible fraud if you if you have any doubts regarding reliability of audit evidence so third component critical assessment of audit evidence whatever evidence you have got you need to critically analyze when i say critically analyze you have to analyze it from multiple perspectives whatever evidence you have got is it enough is it sufficient is there any requirement of alternative or evidence or alternative or additional evidence is the evidence whatever you have obtained is it appropriate so like this from multiple perspectives you have to critically analyze the audit evidence and by maintaining this attitude of professional skepticism you can reduce different kinds of risk as an auditor by maintaining professional skepticism you can reduce various kinds of risk sir what kind of risk i can reduce sir risk of over generalizing while taking decisions you can reduce the risk of taking over generalization you will not do over generalization see over generalization means for example if i say a dog will have how many legs you will say four now if i say all the all the animals which have four legs are dogs I am over generalizing a fact. So, over generalizing is actually bad for audit. If I put it in audit terms, for example, I started verification with purchases. In the purchases, I did not find any misstatement. Now, if I do over generalization, what it looks like is since in the purchases there is no misstatement, in all other areas also there will not be any misstatement. This is over generalization, which is bad for audit. But if you maintain professional skepticism, you will not do over generalization. Your thought process will be if in the purchases there is no misstatement, why can't there be misstatement in other areas? So that questioning mind will be there. So by maintaining professional skepticism, you can reduce the risk of over generalizing while taking decisions. You can also reduce the risk of overlooking unusual circumstances. Overlooking means ignoring. You will not ignore unusual circumstances. You will pay more attention. And also you can reduce the risk of taking inappropriate decisions regarding nature, timing and extent of audit procedures. Which means if you maintain professional skepticism, you can make more appropriate decisions regarding nature, timing and extent of audit procedures clear everybody so this is what the concept of professional skepticism once again an important concept clear everybody able to understand whatever i'm trying to say here so now let us try to proceed further with remaining concepts let us now proceed further with the next question so i want you to take to take you through now one more important question one more small but important question this one very very important from the examination fact uh, examination perspective what are the factors which are required to be considered before accepting and continuing a client relationship as per SA, SA 220. So before you accept a client relationship or before you continue the client relationship, before you take that decision, first of all, we need to understand when we will accept the client relationship, when we will continue the client relationship. For example, there is some new client, you did not do any assignment for him previously, a new client came to your office and is asking you to do some audit assignment for you. What decision you will take? There you will take the decision whether to accept that client relationship or not. Sometimes existing client only will be there. Last year you know a client X Limited. Last year you have done some audit for him. So last year you have done company audit for him. In the current year the existing client only but he is asking you to do new engagement. Like take for example in the last year 2021 for the client X Limited you did company audit. The same client 21-22 X Limited, he came to me and asked me to do tax audit. So existing client only, but he is asking me to do some new engagement. Here also you have to take a decision whether to accept that client relationship. Sometimes what will happen is existing client only, he will ask us to do existing engagement only, which means for example, last year 1920, I have done a company, uh, last year 2021, I had done, I have done a company audit. Now in the current year, the same client is asking me to do company audit once again. So existing client, existing engagement, here I have to take a decision whether to continue the client relationship or not. So in some circumstances, I will take a decision regarding acceptance of the client relationship. In some circumstances, I have to take a decision regarding continuation of the client relationship. Now the question is, before you accept or continue the client relationship, before you say yes or no for the engagement, what factors you will consider? What factors you will consider and take the decision whether I should say yes to the client or whether I should say no to the client on, on the basis of what factors you will try to consider? 
so now uh, essay 220 says before you accept or continue the client relationship four factors you have to consider which is standard says it SA 220 says there are four factors which you are required to consider before you accept or continue the client relationship sir what are the four factors so very simple number one you have to consider the integrity of the principal owners key management and those charged with governance you have to consider how honest your top your clients top level management are like for example if you are approached by a client whose top level management is very dishonest persons they are known for committing frauds once in every six months they go to jail so if such a client is coming to you and asking you to do the audit generally if i am a prudent auditor i will try to stay away from that kind of clients so like this first factor what you should check is before you accept or continue the client relationship you have to check the integrity honesty of the top level management of your client number two whether engagement team is competent that means if you accept or continue that audit are you capable enough to complete the audit which means do you have enough of resources do you have enough of time to complete the audit why because if you don't check your capability for example you are a newly practicing chartered accountant you have only two article assistants in your office one day a company of thousand crores came to you and asked you to do the audit out of excitement you said yes later you realized you don't have enough of staff to complete the audit you don't have enough of time to complete the audit then client will suffer auditor will suffer stakeholders will suffer so that's why what the standard says is before you say yes or no to the client relationship then only you analyze are you competent enough are you capable enough do you have enough of time and resources to complete the audit if you have accept if you don't have don't accept next one whether the firm and engagement team can comply with relevant ethical requirements just now i have told you what are ethical requirements now before you say yes or no to the client relationship you should also check if i accept this client will i be able to comply with ethical requirements or is there any possibility of violating my ethical requirements like i have told five ethical requirements so before accepting only you have to check will i be able to comply with this ethical requirements if i accept this audit and finally you should also consider any significant matters that have arisen during the previous or current years audit assignments so this is particularly suitable last point is particularly suitable in case of existing client for example last year you have done one audit for the client now in the last year your client troubled you a lot you asked for information client did not give two three times you asked one day a client has come to beat me now somehow i did the audit but after completion of audit the client is coming to me and asking sir please do the audit for the current year also will you do it i will not do it so like this even you have to consider even significant matters are there any significant matters which have arisen during previous audits consider that factors also and take the decision accordingly will it be suitable for me to say yes or no to this client relationship so as per essay 220 these are the four factors which you are required to consider integrity of the top level management of the client whether engagement team is capable enough to complete the audit whether you will be able to comply with ethical requirements and is there any significant matter which have arisen during the course of previous audit assignments understood so this is actually taken from essay 220 now with this we are done with uh, the concepts from essay 200 now we will go to essay 210 balance questions whatever are there in this chapter those are actually taken from essay 210 essay 210 is actually talking about uh, agreeing to the terms of engagement agreeing to the terms of engagement this is what the main focus of this particular standard nothing but when you accept the audit when you are doing the audit of some client there is a requirement that you and the client should agree on the terms and conditions so what are the terms and conditions of the audit what you are supposed to do what your client is supposed to do so there should be agreement of times and uh, there should be agreement of terms and conditions before you accept the audit if there is no agreement of terms and conditions relating to audit there is a high chance of misunderstanding between the parties so how you have to agree to the terms in what format that agreement will be arrived so all that things will be covered in essay 210 small standard easy standard from the examination perspective important also so listen carefully so as i have told in any commercial in any commercial contract there will always be a chance of misunderstanding between the parties to the contract there will always be a chance of misunderstanding so there will be two parties to the contract in a commercial transaction always there is a chance of misunderstanding between the parties to the contract for example a builder has agreed to construct a building for a landowner they have orally agreed so many terms and conditions how many floors have to be constructed what amount will be paid what quality of cement has to be used all that terms and conditions they have orally agreed but in future what could happen is so many misunderstandings can come might be the builder is not using the cement which he has agreed or might be landowner is not paying the remuneration what he has agreed so like that in any commercial transaction there is always a chance of misunderstanding between the parties to the contract 
Now you tell me, can we do one simple thing to avoid all that misunderstandings in the case of commercial contracts? Can we do one simple thing to avoid all that misunderstandings? Yes, one simple thing we can do. So what we can do is whenever we are entering into any commercial contract, whatever terms and conditions are there, instead of agreeing orally, put it down on a piece of paper. Both the parties to the contract should sign it. Both of them should keep one copy. If you keep that written agreement of terms and conditions in future, if at all any misunderstandings comes, you can easily sort it out. Yes or no? Audit is also not an exception. Audit is also a commercial contract only. Being an auditor, we agree to pro provide services to the client and the, si uh, and the client will agree to pay the fees in return. So like any commercial contract, even audit is also a commercial contract. Like in any other commercial contract, there is a chance of misunderstanding. Even in the audit also, there will be a chance of misunderstanding. Take for example, you are conducting audit of some company. You went to the management and told, sir, give me financial statements. I will do the audit. Management is telling, you have to only prepare the financial statements. You are only supposed to prepare financial statements. Misunderstanding. Or the client might not pay the fees agreed. So like that, even in the audit also, there is a chance of misunderstanding. Sir, what we can do, sir, in the case of chance of misunderstanding, in the case of audit also, to avoid this misunderstanding, what we can do? Like the way we do in other cases, here also, take a piece of paper, write down all the terms and conditions, auditor will sign it, client will sign it, both will keep one copy, and this one single written document which contain terms and conditions of audit will be enough to sort out the misunderstandings between auditor and client. And this written document which contains the terms and conditions relating to the audit, this in the audit terminology, we call it as engagement letter or even we can call it as letter of engagement understood so what is engagement letter or letter of engagement the written the written document which contains the terms and conditions relating to the audit that we call it as engagement letter or letter of engagement and how to prepare that engagement letter what should be the contents of that engagement letter what should be the format of the engagement letter everything has been given under sa 210 and SA 210 specifically says that auditor should prepare the engagement letter and give it to the client. Very important statement I made here as per SA 210. It is whose responsibility to prepare engagement letter. Auditor shall prepare the engagement letter and give it to the client. Not the client will prepare the engagement letter and give it to the auditor. It is always the responsibility of the auditor to prepare the engagement letter and give it to the client. Very, very important for the true or false statements. Clear? And also, let me ask you one more question. Before we see what are the contents of the engagement letter, I have one more question for you. You tell me, we have seen two kinds of audit, statutory audit and non-statutory audit. In which kind of audit do you think engagement letter is very, very important? In which kind of audit engagement letter is very, very important? So as per the standards, or even if you take the practical perspective, the importance of engagement letter is very high in the case of non-statutory audit. Why? Because in the case of statutory audit, as I have told, terms and conditions that is scope and objective will be decided by law. So in the case of statutory audit, even though if you don't have engagement letter, you need not worry. Why? Because the terms and conditions would have already been given under respective law. Law will come to your rescue in case of misunderstanding. But in the case of non-statutory audit, there will be no law or regulation which will come to our rescue. There is uh, non-statutory audit is not required under any law itself. And here if the engagement letter is missing, no one will come to your rescue. Even the law will not come to your rescue. So in the case of non-statutory audit, since in these cases, uh, law will not interfere and tell you the terms and conditions. In the case of non-statutory audit, the importance of engagement letter is many fold than when compared with the statutory audit. And uh, But practically what will happen is in both the cases, in statutory as well as non-statutory audit, in both the cases, generally the client and auditor will have a terms of engagement able to understand everybody now sir what will be the contents of the engagement letter what and all will be the contents of engagement letter so here we have given here so what is engagement letter or letter of engagement and what should be the contents of the engagement letter so here we have given the contents of engagement letter first there should be title title means was uh, title means what and heading should be there engagement letter or letter of engagement appropriate title should be there Addressee, you have to address this engagement letter to someone. Auditor is preparing. Who will be addressee? The management of the client. Then you have to include a paragraph in explaining about objective and scope of the scope of the audit. What is your objective? What is your scope? Like tell like tell that you are required to obtain reasonable assurance. You are required to express an opinion. So all that objective and scope paragraph should be there. Then you have to include one paragraph which will explain the responsibilities of the auditor. As an auditor, what you are supposed to do. Next, you should also include one paragraph explaining responsibilities of management. As a management, what the management is supposed to do, you have to explain, you have to add one paragraph. 
and also you have to identify applicable financial reporting framework you should also give hint what kind of applicable financial reporting framework will be applicable for your client and also reference to expected form and content of the audit reports also give a reference how you are going to how your audit report will be according to which standards you have to prepare the audit report give reference to the form and content of the auditor's report also and finally after including all the terms auditor should sign it and after signing it you give it to the client if the client is signing and giving it back to you that indicates that client has agreed to the terms whatever has been mentioned and finally mention the date and the place also clear everybody so these are all the contents these are all should be the contents of the engagement letter all this contents should be there in your engagement letter clear and comfortable everybody so what should be the contents title addressee objective and scope responsibilities of the auditor responsibilities of management what applicable financial reporting framework the client is supposed to follow expected form and content of any report signature of the auditor signature of the client indicating acceptance and date and place of audit date and place of that engagement letter so all this contents should be there in your engagement letter and even if you want to have a format what exactly will be there in each and every paragraph for practical purposes if you want to learn just open the study material or download essay 210 from the google at the end of essay 210 you will be able to find a format that format if you follow that format you can simply copy paste and use it if you have attended our regular classes i have shown you practically how to draft that engagement letter and in case if tomorrow as a part of your article ship if your partner is asking you to prepare the engagement letter no need to ask for his guidance just download essay 210 go to and there will be something called appendix in that appendix copy the format change the client's name change your auditor's name that's all engagement letter will be prepared your client your partner will be very happy if you do that okay so in our regular classes we have understood this in a very detailed manner and also in a very practical way we have understood it so these are all the contents of engagement letter now one more thing here here we have told responsibilities of management here one of the content of the engagement letter is responsibilities of management now what are those responsibilities of the management what actually are the responsibilities of the management see these responsibilities of management we also call them as preconditions for an audit we also call them as what preconditions for an audit or even we can call them as a premise to audit so when they ask you the question what are responsibilities of management or even if they ask you the question what are preconditions for an audit or even if they ask you the question what is premise to audit for all those three questions answer is going to remain the same sir why management responsibilities are called as preconditions simple logic guys what is precondition some things which must exist before i do something for example if i gave you some instructions and told if you have to attend my classes you have to follow these rules that is a precondition for my class that means some things which should be present before i can do some task that i call it as preconditions so if i have to do the audit management has to fulfill some responsibilities unless and until management fulfills their responsibilities i will not be able to do the audit so that's why these responsibilities of the management i call it as preconditions for an audit one simple example if i have to give see as an auditor i have to verify financial statements if the management does not agree to prepare the financial statements will i be able to do the audit no so one of the responsibility of the management is to prepare financial statements that is nothing but a precondition for an audit so that's why responsibilities of management has been given various other names we also call it as preconditions for an audit we even call it as premise to an audit okay so in case if they ask you the question what are preconditions to audit what is premise to audit you are supposed to write this answer so what are those responsibilities what are those preconditions for an audit number one the management is responsible for the preparation of financial statements that also in accordance with applicable financial reporting framework number one that is the first responsibility preparation of financial statements that to as per applicable financial reporting framework number two they are also responsible for implementation of internal controls not just preparing financial statements management is also responsible for implementation of internal controls and to provide the auditor that means to provide the auditor to give the auditor with access to all information such as records documents and other matters so if auditor has to do the audit management is having responsibility to give him all records documents and various other matters whatever auditor requires and not just that additional information the management has given books of accounts to the auditor now if auditor needs any further explanation if the auditor needs any further clarification who is responsible to give that additional information once again management so management has to provide auditor with access to all information like records documents and other matters and also they should give the auditor additional information whatever auditor is asking in addition to that it is the responsibility of the management to provide the auditor with unrestricted access to persons within the entity if the auditor wants to question the employees in the organization it is the responsibility of the management to give access to the employees of the organization without any restriction 
clear so these are all the responsibilities of management in case if they ask you the question preconditions of audit responsibilities of management or even premise to audit for all these three things you are supposed to write the same answer very simple guys preparation of financial statements implementation of internal controls to give auditor three things all records documents additional information whatever auditor requires and also without any restriction giving access to the people within the entity so these three are uh, these three are uh, responsibilities of the management sir what happens if preconditions are not present not present if you are supposed to do the audit but you came to know that in that audit preconditions will not be there that means management will not prepare financial statements management will not prepare internal controls management will not give auditor access to all the information what you will do don't accept the audit only so that's what they say if the preconditions for an auditor not present the auditor shall not accept the proposed audit engagement if you came to know that preconditions are not there that means you came to know that management will not prepare financial statements management will not implement internal controls management will not give you access to the records management will not give you access to additional information they will not allow you to question to the employees of the organization what you will do i will say no sir i will not accept the audit clear so if preconditions are not present you are not supposed to accept the audit clear everybody so this is what relating to preconditions so we have seen sa 210 in that we have seen what are the contents of engagement letter and also we have seen preconditions for an audit now let us talk about few more things relating to engagement letter and terms of engagement there are few more concepts from sa 210 let us try to understand those also so now coming to the next concept yeah we will try to understand this question number 19 which is talking about a requirement of engagement letter in the case of recurring audits so first of all before we understand what are the circumstances in which we give engagement letter in the case of recurring audit first we have to understand what is the meaning of the recurring audit see on the basis of requirements of law we have divided audits into two categories statutory non-statutory now i am going to do one more classification for audit on the basis of person getting appointed as auditor so on the basis of person getting appointed as auditor audit can be divided into two categories number one initial audit engagement and number two recurring audit Sir, what is initial audit engagement? If I have to put it in simple terms, if the last year auditor and the current year auditor, both are two different persons. If the last, if the current year auditor is different from the last year's auditor, that we call it as initial audit engagement. So then what is recurring audit? The name itself says, if the last year auditor is only appointed as current year auditor, if the last year auditor itself is appointed as current year's auditor, we call that assignment as recurring audit, as simple as that. That is last year auditor, current year auditor, both are same. Now, let us talk about requirement of engagement letter. In the case of initial audit engagement, do you think engagement letter is required? Yes, very much required. In the case of initial audit engagement, engagement letter is very much required. There is no doubt about it. But the question is, sir, in the case of recurring audit, is it required to give engagement letter year after year? Take for example, in the year 21-22, there is an auditor, Mr. A, he conducted audit of the client X Limited company audit he has done. Now for the next year, 22-23, the same auditor has been appointed as company auditor for the same client. Same client, same auditor, same scope. Last year, he would have given engagement letter. Do you think in the current year audit also, he is compulsorily required to give the engagement letter once again? The answer is no. The standard did not make it compulsory. SA-210 did not make it compulsory. So what SA-210 has done is, in case of recurring audit, it has left it to the choice of the auditor. Let the auditor himself decide whether to give the engagement letter or not. In the case of recurring audit, there is no compulsion put by the standard. The standard has simply left it to the choice of the auditor. So if the auditor wants to give engagement letter in the case of recurring audit, give it. Even if he, if he decides not to give the engagement letter, then also fine, standard is having no objection. But what the standard has done is, it has listed out a few circumstances in which even though it is a recurring audit, still it is required to give engagement letter. Generally, normal circumstances, the standard has given the choice to the auditor in the case of recurring audit, whether to give the engagement letter or not to give the engagement letter. But the standard has identified few circumstances where even though it is a recurring audit, it is highly advisable to give the engagement letter in some circumstances. Sir, in which circumstances? Very simple. If you apply the logic, you will get it simply. For example, there is a change in the management of the client. Last year, you did the audit of the same company, but in the current year, the management has changed. It is advisable to give engagement letter once again or not? Yes. Or there is a change in the nature of the client's business. There is an expansion of the client's business. There is a change in ownership or new, uh, new applicable financial reporting framework has come into picture or there are some changes in the laws and regulations. So if these kind of circumstances happen, then even though if it is a recurring audit, still it is highly advisable to give the engagement letter. If these circumstances are not there, even though it is a recurring engagement, the auditor might not give engagement letter. 
So logic is very simple. The standard has given few circumstances. If any of the circumstances the auditor comes across, even though it is a recurring audit, give the engagement letter. If these circumstances are not there, auditor may not give engagement letter, not a compulsion. So what are that circumstances? So very simple. An indication that entity misunderstands objective and scope. Last year you have given engagement letter. But in the current day you understood that the management has misunderstood the last year terms and conditions. Try to sort out that misunderstanding by giving once again a new engagement letter or any revised or special terms of the audit engagement. Audit engagement terms and conditions have changed. Then also give a new engagement letter or recent change in senior management. The top level management of the client has undergone some changes. Significant change in ownership. Your client's ownership has changed. Or significant change in nature of size of nature and size of the client's business, change in laws and regulations, change in financial reporting framework, or change in any other reporting requirements. So, if any of these circumstances persist, then even though it is a recurring audit, still give engagement letter. If these circumstances are not there, then no need to give the engagement letter. Okay, right. So now we will try to understand two simple questions, conceptual questions. Question number 20. What if management imposes a limitation on scope prior to the audit engagement acceptance so which means if i try to give it a scenario what they are trying to ask you in the question for example you are a practicing chartered accountant one day you are sitting in your office the management of some client came the board of directors of some company came to your office they came to you and told sir you please do company audit for our client for our company x limited you are a chartered accountant sitting in your office. The management of some X Limited came to your office and they are asking you, sir, you please do the company audit for us. You did not say yes yet. Before you accept the audit only, the client is putting restriction. The management is telling, sir, you do the company audit for us, but we will not give you any information regarding sales. Don't verify sales. You do the company audit for us. We will not give you information regarding fixed assets. You do the company audit for us, but we will not let you verify the inventory. So here the client is imposing a limitation even before you accept the audit. If you are in the auditor's chair in this situation, if you are in the auditor's chair, what you will do? What you will do? Simply I will ask the client to get lost. Simple no. If the client is putting a restriction on your work even before you have accepted the audit, who will accept the audit? Don't accept the audit only. That's what you are supposed to do. Why? Because before accepting the audit only if the client is putting a restriction, why are you supposed to accept it? Don't accept it. That's what even the standard has also told, but just so they have put the common sense in a uh, sentence. So if we read the answer, if the management or those charged with guidance imposes a limitation on the scope of the auditor's work, uh, on, on the scope of the auditor's work, prior to accepting the audit, you did not say yes, then only management is coming and putting a restriction on you. Don't accept the audit at all. Simply don't accept the audit. Say no to the audit. Why you should accept the audit? If before accepting only, they are putting a restriction. Yes or no? Now, the next question is, sir, before accepting the audit, the client did not put any restriction. Before accepting the audit, the client did not put any restriction. But after I have accepted the audit, then the client is coming and putting the restriction on my work. See, if before accepting the audit only, they would have put a restriction, we would have said no to the audit. But the problem is, when I was supposed to accept the audit, they did not put any restriction. They told, okay, sir, you do whatever you want. But after I have accepted the audit, then the client is coming and putting a restriction on my work. Then what I am supposed to do, sir? Then what I am supposed to do? In that case, SA 210 is giving some guidance. That guidance I have actually summarized in the form of a chart. Let me try to present that chart before you for easy understanding and revision. Yeah, this one. So let me copy it here. Copy the page. The page just a minute just a minute guys yes got it see here so what if client is asking for changes in the terms of engagement after accepting the audit see before accepting the audit if the client is asking for the changes in the terms we will simply don't accept but when the problem arises is the client is coming to me asking me for the changes in the terms after i have accepted the audit so you have said yes engagement letter is drafted they have agreed both of you signed but later when you are actually started doing the audit then the client is coming and asking you the changes in the terms then what you should do the standard essay 210 says if the client is asking you for changes in the terms after you have accepted the audit first auditor shall understand the reasons you have to understand why the client is now coming and asking you for the changes in the terms so when you understand the reasons two outcomes could be possible Sometimes you might feel that the, the, the reason why the client is coming to me and asking for the changes, there is a valid reason for it. There is a reasonable justification. 
like take for example as an auditor you wanted to verify inventory you wanted to do the physical verification of the stock the management told sorry sir we will not let you do, we will not let you verify the inventory please take out inventory verification from your scope so first i will ask the reason i will ask the management sir what because of what reason you are asking me not to uh, because of what reason you are asking me to take out inventory verification from my scope now the management will give some reasons so you have to analyze is there a valid justification for example management is telling sir at the time when we accepted the audit the warehouse was in our control but recently the last two days ago there was a case going on between us and gst department gst department came and sealed that warehouse that's why you can't verify the stock now valid justification yes why because if a seal has been imposed by the government no one can break it so the management is asking for changes in the terms is there a valid reason yes there is a valid reason so if there is a reasonable justification what the standard is asking you to do is agree to the changes if you find reasonable justification agree to the changes and if you have agreed to the changes old engagement letter will no longer be valid you have to draft a new engagement letter containing the revised terms and conditions and also when you give the final audit report in that final audit report you should not give any reference to old engagement letter and audit procedures which you have performed in the old engagement letter that means your audit report should not contain any reference to previous engagement letter your audit report should contain reference only to the revised terms and conditions everybody clear till here simple till here so if the client is asking you for changes in the terms after you have accepted the audit we will try to understand reasons if you find there is a reasonable justification we can agree to the changes happily but once you have agreed to the changes old engagement letter becomes invalid what you should do draft a new engagement letter and in the audit report which you are giving don't give reference to any old engagement letter understood when the problem arises there is no reasonable justification the client is coming to me asking me for the changes in the terms when i ask them the reasons they are not giving me reasons or they are giving reasons which are not at all valid they are giving me all the bullshit reasons in that case what you will do so if there is no reasonable justification very simple don't agree to the changes don't agree to the changes straight away say to the client sir you are not giving me a valid reason i will not agree to the changes i will do the audit as per original terms only so first thing what you should do when there is no reasonable justification do not agree to the changes see when you don't agree to the changes also two things can happen so you are telling i will not agree to the changes in most of the cases management will not mess with the auditor they will say okay this fellow is not listening let him do the audit as per original terms only you did not agree to the changes and management did not mess with you management permits the auditor to continue the audit as per original terms they did not mess with you they told okay sir you don't agree to the changes okay fine you do the audit as per original terms only then what you will do don't do any issue you continue the audit as per original terms so you did not agree to the changes management did not create any scene there they told okay this fellow is not listening whatever you want to do you do then what you will do simply continue the audit but when the problem will arise is management is asking you for the changes in the terms they did not show any reasonable justification i do not agree to the changes but here the management is trying to create a scene here I don't agree to the changes, but the management is not permitting me to continue the audit as per original terms. Like for example, I want to verify the stock. Management told no. I asked them reasons. They did not give valid justification. I told them, sir, I will not agree to it. I will, I will have to verify the warehouse. Now in most of the cases, what management will do is, okay, they will say, okay, sir, if you are not listening, go and verify the stock. Well and good. Then I will continue the audit. But when the problem arises is, I told, no boss, I have to verify the warehouse. Now the management is telling, no, sir, you can't verify. We will not give you the key of the warehouse. Or we will deploy some people at the warehouse who will not permit you to go inside the warehouse. So I am not agreeing to the changes in the terms, but the management is not permitting me to carry out the audit as per original terms. In that case, what the standard is suggesting you to do is withdraw from the audit resign from the audit no longer continue the audit resign from the audit so this is what you are supposed to do in case if the client is coming to you and asking you for the changes in the terms understood everybody very simple so if the client is asking you for the changes in the terms when after you have accepted the audit before accept before accepting the audit only if they are putting limitation we will not accept only the actual problem arises when after we have accepted the audit first understand reasons reasonable justification well and good agree to the changes draft new engagement letter you should not give any reference to old engagement letter in your audit report no reasonable justification uh, don't agree if you don't agree management did not create a scene they agree to continue the uh, they permit you to continue the audit as per original terms do the audit silently and come back but if they are creating a scene, management is not permitting the auditor to continue the audit as per original terms, then what you should do? Withdraw from the audit engagement. So this is what you are supposed to do in case if the client is coming to you and asking you for the changes in the terms of audit engagement.
clear everybody so there are few more questions let us try to quickly revise that few more questions and wind up the chapter nature objective and scope of order so question number 23 very simple one who appoints an auditor also explain to whom the report is submitted so two questions they are asking generally who will make an appointment of auditor who will make an appointment of auditor guys generally the owners of the company will make an appointment take for example if it is a sole proprietor sole proprietor will appoint if it is a partnership firm partners will appoint if it is a company shareholders will appoint generally auditor will be appointed by owners but in some extreme cases even regulatory authorities even government authorities also will make an appointment of auditor like take for example in case of government companies c and ag will make an appointment c and ag is a government authority in case of certain banks rbi will involve in the appointment so generally who will make appointment in 90 percent of the cases owners depending upon the entity's legal structure owners will make an appointment of the auditor but in some rare circumstances the appointment of the auditor will be done by constitutional or government authorities like in the case of government company c and ag is going to make an appointment of auditor clear next one sir to whom report is submitted one half of the question we have answered who appoints the auditor the next half of the question who, to whom report is submitted whoever appointed you to that people only will submit the report the same thing they say the outcome of audit is written audit report and the report is submitted to the persons whoever is making the appointment so whoever has made the appointment to same persons you will submit your audit report also like in the case of companies we will submit to shareholders in the case of partnership firm we will submit it to partners in the case of a sole proprietorship firm we will submit it to the sole proprietor Leo. so this is what one simple question this is uh this was a question which is added in the new scheme this question was not there in the old scheme but once again a simple question so now let us try to begin our discussion with question number 24 sir what is question number 24 talking about very important question from the examination perspective please pay complete attention explain the meaning and elements of assurance engagement so in this particular question i am going to teach you i am going to explain you about what is the meaning of the term assurance engagement so little bit important discussion guys please pay attention so engagement means simply a kind of contract a promise a mutual promises we call it as engagement so this i have already told you when i was explaining about this concept of engagement letter engagement means a mutual agreement a mutual contract that's what we are going to call it as engagement so now they are asking you what is the meaning of assurance engagement this i will try to explain it in a detailed manner please pay complete attention meaning of assurance engagement assurance engagement means an engagement in which a practitioner practitioner means professional so assurance engagement is an engagement in which a practitioner expresses a conclusion opinion or something or an uh, practitioner will try to give his conclusion which is designed to enhance degree of confidence of intended users assurance engagement is a kind of engagement in which as a practitioner i will express a conclusion and what is the purpose of my conclusion to enhance to increase the degree of confidence of intended users and those intended users are other than responsible party other than responsible party about the outcome or evaluation of a subject matter against criteria let us try to uh, point, uh, make a list here the important terms which we need to have a clarity in order to understand this assurance definition number one we need to know someone called practitioner listen carefully guys we need to call someone called practitioner and actually there are three parties in an assurance engagement there will be three parties number one practitioner then we have someone called responsible party we'll have someone called responsible party then we will have one more party called intended users intended users listen carefully very simple concept not at all complicated i will try to make it as simple as i can so in the assurance engagement three parties will be there Number one, practitioner. Sir, what do you mean by practitioner? Practitioner means professional like you and me. Like for our example, we will take a CA in practice. A CA in practice, for example. So a practitioner will be there. There will be another party called responsible party. Responsible party means a party which is having certain responsibilities relating to some activity. A party which is having some responsibilities to fulfill. Then we have someone called intended users. Sir, what is intended users? Ultimate users. Ultimate users of certain subject matter then this entire process will revolve through one subject matter there will be the main information regarding which all this verification and all is happening see they told as a practitioner you have to express conclusion about what you have to express conclusion there should be certain subject matter there should be certain subject matter and this subject matter is compared with some criteria whether the subject matter is as per certain criteria or not first responsible party will prepare the subject matter according to the criteria practitioner will verify the subject matter whether it is correctly as per criteria 
on that he will express a conclusion which will increase the confidence of intended users of the information confusing don't worry don't don't worry please listen carefully now let us try to understand this entire assurance engagement with the help of audit audit discussion we already had no let us try to understand what exactly happens in the audit see in the audit assignment what we do we chartered accountants we are practitioners in the audit assignment what we do we are chartered accountants in practice we are the practitioners so what is the definition of audit what we have understood audit audit is an independent examination of financial information audit is an independent examination of financial information so what is the entire subject matter of the audit what is the main aspect in the entire audit assignment financial information so in a audit assignment a practitioner is a chartered accountant in practice subject matter subject matter means around which matter the entire audit activity is happening what is audit all about audit is all about financial information so in a audit assignment subject matter is financial information responsible party who is responsible for preparation of financial information management who is responsible for preparation of financial statements management who are intended users who are the ultimate users of the financial statements shareholders can i say shareholders the ultimate users of the financial statements are shareholders and for preparation of this financial information for preparation of this subject matter will there be any criteria yes what is that criteria called as applicable financial reporting framework what is that criteria applicable financial reporting framework is a criteria so in the entire audit assignment what we do we as a practitioner we will try to express a conclusion nothing but we will try to express our opinion about what about the financial information yes or no this conclusion for what purpose to enhance to increase confidence of intended users to increase the confidence of shareholders and who are other than intended party sorry who are other than responsible party are we doing the audit for the purpose of management no we are doing the audit to increase the confidence of intended users who are shareholders and shareholders are other than management see are we doing audit to increase the confidence of the management or to increase the confidence of the shareholders we are doing the audit to increase the confidence of shareholders able to understand so and we are verifying whether this subject matter which is a financial information whether it is as per applicable financial reporting framework or not that is the criteria against which financial information should be prepared now can i say this audit assignment is falling under assurance assignment this audit assignment is falling under assurance engagement or not why because this is what assurance engagement definition we have read from the material what we have read assurance engagement definition so they told that assurance engagement means an engagement in which a practitioner expresses a conclusion designed to enhance the confidence of the intended users other than responsible party about the outcome or evaluation of a subject matter against this criteria so what is happening here this audit assignment whatever we are doing this is also falling under assurance engagement whatever audit assignment we are doing that is nothing but what assurance engagement now let me give one more example assume that there is certain company some company x limited it is going for public issue it is going for public issue ipo they are going for ipo for the first time and the management of the entity prepared prospectus the management of the entity prepared prospectus now they asked certain chartered accountant to give a report whether the prospectus is completely as per the company's act and also whatever information that is stated in the prospectus whether it is correct or not this company this management of the company approached one chartered accountant and they asked him sir you please verify our prospectus and tell and give us a report that this prospectus is completely prepared as per company's act and all the information in the prospectus is correct or not so that whoever is applying for our ipo whoever wants to subscribe whoever wants to apply for our ipo their confidence will get increased now let us see what is happening here there is a practitioner here who is a practitioner chartered accountant being myself there is a responsible party who is responsible for preparation of the prospectus management who is the ultimate user of that prospectus the ultimate user will be those people who wants to apply for this ipo these are not currently shareholders these are prospective shareholders they want to become the shareholders of the company so prospective shareholders these are the people who are who want to apply for ipo so these are intended users these are intended users and in this <laughs> in this subject matter i am trying to verify being a practitioner a chartered accountant i am trying to verify subject matter what is the subject matter of this entire assignment prospectus what is the subject matter of this entire assignment prospectus so prospectus is what subject matter and this prospectus i want to check it against some criteria what is the criteria for this prospectus companies act 2013 that is a criteria so in this assignment in which a company asked me to give a or give a report on the prospectus what is actually happening i am a practitioner i am trying to express a conclusion 
to increase the confidence of intended users who are prospective shareholders who are other than responsible party management and in this assignment i am evaluating a subject matter against some criteria what is the criteria here the criteria is companies act 2013 understood can i call this as assurance assignment yes can i call this as assurance assignment yes can i call this as audit no this is not audit as i have told audit is also a kind of assurance assignment apart from audit there will be various kinds of assignments which will fall under assurance previous example whatever i have told that is falling under audit assignment also that is falling under assurance assignment also but audit is not the only assurance assignment the term assurance assignment is a very broader term even whatever example i have told the appointment of a chartered accountant to issue a report on the prospectus will this also fall under assurance assignment yes yes understood so if i draw something like this for example if this is entire assurance engagement so assurance engagements contain different activities like giving a tax report uh, calculations on tax report giving a report on prospectors giving a report on some gst calculations so like this assurance engagement is a very wider area which takes into account the different kinds of activ activities in that one of the assurance engagement is audit also in that one of the assurance engagement is audit also so assurance engagement is a very wider term which involves a different kinds of activities in that one of the assignment is audit assignment also able to understand that's all this is what the meaning of assurance engagement and as a part of this explanation i have explained you the complete answer elements also have explained if you have a doubt you can check so this point we have read so a meaning of assurance engagement so what are the elements of assurance engagement as i have told in the assurance engagement there will be three parties who are the three parties in the assurance engagement a three party relationship involving a practitioner a responsible party and intended users as i have told in an assurance engagement there will always be three parties who are they a practitioner practitioner is a person who provides the assurance like in our example in audit example a chartered accountant in practice the term practitioner is broader than auditor since all all assurance assignments need not be done only by chartered accountant there will be various assignments in which other professionals also can be there for example if you take cost audit cost accountant will do but cost audit also will fall under assurance engagement only so when i say practitioner practitioner need not always be only a chartered accountant in practice so various other people also can give that report depending on circumstances so the term practitioner is broader than auditor audit is related to historical information whereas practitioner may provide assurance not necessarily related to historical financial information see this you will get clarity this sentence you leave it what is historical information what is not historical information so this uh, better clarity you will get it when we reach the standards on auditing chapter so this point you keep it on hold this will be automatically covered in the standards on audit so three parties will be there number one practitioner number two responsible party is the party responsible for preparation of subject matter one more party will be intended users those who to whom the assurance report will be given who will be ultimately using that report that we call it as intended users so in the assurance engagement one number one element is there should be three party relationship next there should be certain subject matter that means entire assurance act, assurance engagement will review around one subject matter in case of audit it is financial information in another case it is prospectus in some other case it is tax calculation so it refers to the information that has to be examined by the practitioner suitable criteria now for preparing that subject matter there will be certain criteria like for the purpose of financial statements it will be schedule 3 for the purpose of prospectus it will be companies act for the purpose of tax calculation it will be income tax act so like that for the preparation of that subject matter there will be certain suitable criteria so these refer to some benchmark benchmark means some rules some standards rules which are used to evaluate the subject matter like standards guidance laws rules and regulations and every time whenever we are doing assurance engagement for example if we have to express opinion in the case of audit we express opinion i might have told you in the inherent limitations of audit will we just like that express opinion or our opinion will be based on some evidence sufficient and appropriate audit evidence should be there similarly in one more assignment here auditor has to express his conclusion on prospectus now in that prospectus will he blindly give or will he try to obtain audit evidence he will try to obtain audit evidence don't read this paragraph now sufficient appropriate evidence this you will get better clarity in the chapter audit documentation and audit evidence trust me when you refer to the chapter audit documentation and evidence evidence whatever the terms which are used here what is sufficient what is appropriate what is the ultimate meaning of evidence everything will be automatically covered in audit documentation and evidence for the time being you just remember for doing assurance engagement we need evidence we need what evidence on the basis of evidence we will express a conclusion that you remember whatever extra other content that has been given here that will be automatically covered in audit documentation and evidence chapter you keep it on hold next one finally whatever conclusion we are giving will we express that conclusion orally no we will always give that a uh, final conclusion in the form of a written report a written report will be given in the case of audit we give audit report in the case of prospectus there also will give some report in the case of verifying tax calculations there also we give certain kind of a report so there will be ultimate report so let us now let us now try to cover the last question from this chapter very simple question so let me read and explain it 
briefly outline how principle based approach differ from rule based approach to ethics simple concept guys let us not over complicate it i will try to tell you in simple way and try to understand that much only don't go deeper into the details see as we all know as an auditor we are we are supposed to follow some ethics ethical requirements are there like i have told you you should be independent you should be objective you should be having integrity so like this as an auditor we need to have some ethics and there are numerous amount of ethics which we need to follow more about that ethics we will try to talk about at the ca final level at the CA final level, we have a dedicated chapter called Professional Ethics. There we will try to understand in a detailed manner. There are numerous ethics which we need to follow. We will talk more about that ethics which you need to follow at the CA final level. But when it comes to ethics, there are two approaches which are there. When uh, I, Generally, I say will give you the ethics. I, I say will give you a list of ethics which you are required to follow. And in giving that ethics, in making the ethics mandatory for the auditor, there could be two approaches. One is principle based approach and the other one is rule based approach to the ethics. When an institute or any other, in any other case, if you have to follow some ethics, ethics can uh, to make the ethics implemented, there will be two approaches. Number one is either it could be principle based approach, other one could be rule based approach. So then what is this principle based approach to ethics and what is this rule based approach to ethics? Let me try to explain it with one simple example see first i will talk about rule based uh, rule based approach so this i will try to explain it with the help of independence for example i told you that as an auditor you have to be independent as an auditor you have to be independent now sir how the auditor can be independent how he can make sure that he can be independent for example assume that if ICI is telling some four conditions this is just example guys this is just example don't take it as a literal thing from any act or so for the purpose of making you understand what is principle based approach what is rule based approach I'm trying to just give you one illustration. Assume that ICI or some act has told if you have to be independent, you should avoid yourself from four kind of scenarios. So ICI is telling avoid four kind of scenarios to remain independent. What are that four scenarios, sir? Don't become auditor of a company in which you are having shares. Don't become auditor of a company in which you are having shares. Don't become auditor of a company to which you are indebted. That means uh, you are you have taken some money from the company from that company uh, from that com you owe some amount to the company to that company you don't act as an auditor or if you have any given if you have given any guarantee to the company if you have any if you have given any guarantee to the company then also you don't accept the audit or if you have taken any loan if you have taken any loan then also don't conduct audit of that company. So this is a rule based approach. ICA is telling in order to be independent you have to follow these four rules. You have to follow this four rules to remain independent. This is a rule based approach. That means the uh, some institute is giving a list of certain numbers. For example, 10 rules, 15 rules. If you have to be, uh, you have to follow these 15 list of rules. That is a rule based approach. Other one is principle based approach. When I say principle based approach here, there will not be any rules. It all depends on professional judgment. For example, if I follow rule based approach, what will happen is the ICI is prohibiting to act as an auditor. If I am having four kind of relationships, if I am having shares, I should not accept. If I am having debt, I should uh, if I am indebted to the company, I should not accept audit. If I have given any guarantee, then I should not accept audit. If I have taken any loan, then also I should not accept audit. Now, if I follow strictly rule based approach, I will say that, for example, I'm having debentures. I bought the debentures of the company. Now I will say, okay, ICA in the rules, they are giving only four circumstances. They did not mention the debentures. That means if I have debentures, still I can accept as auditor. Still I can hold that position as auditor. This thing will happen when you follow rule based approach. Why? Because ICA is giving you only four rules. This scenario, if I hold the debentures of the company, this is not covered in the rules. I will say, since this is not covered in the rule, I will accept the audit of that company. But if you follow principle based approach, what will happen, you know? Here, there will not be any strict rules. It all depends on the professional judgment. So in the principle based approach, even in this case also, I will not accept audit. Why? Because the institute is telling me to be independent, not just in this four circumstances. Even if I subscribe for the debentures of the company, then also there is a possibility of my independence getting compromised. So I will apply my professional judgment here and I will say even if I hold the debentures also, still I am having some sort of relationship with the company. I might not act independently. My independence will be in danger. So in this case also, I will not accept audit. That is a principle based approach. 
that is a principle based approach that means where strict rules and regulations will not be given it all depends on professional judgment whether to follow that whether to follow this or whether not to follow this that all depends on the professional judgment that is a principle based approach but when i say rule based approach here strict some set of rules and regulations will be given just follow that rules if certain scenario is outside of that rules there will be no problem there will be no problem i will tell you one simple thing i will tell you one simple thing guys for example i am teaching you class there is a physical class I am teaching some hundred students. I told my students during the class you should not talk. During the class you should not talk. During the class, uh, no mobile phones, no calls are allowed, no texting is allowed, no texting is allowed. I gave you these three rules. Okay. So in this case, you should not talk. You should not use mobile. You should not uh, do chatting. Now one person is coming to the class and he is sleeping. One person is coming to the class and he is sleeping. He is telling. I, when I asked him, boss, why are you coming to the class and sleeping? He is telling, sir, you gave me only three rules, no? You told me not to talk. You know, you told me not to use the mobile. You told me not to do the chatting. I am not doing any of the three activities. I am doing sleeping. You did not tell me in the rules. This is a rule based approach. On the other hand, if I come to the class and say, Dear students, you have to pay complete focus and attention to my class. I did not tell you these rules. I told, I want complete focus and attention of you in my class. Then if I go, if I find some student sleeping, if I go and question him, can he escape now? Can you say, sir, you did not uh, tell me not to sleep, so you could not punish me. Can you say that? No. Why? Because I told you well in advance, you have to pay complete focus and attention. In that case, sleeping also will come in losing the focus and attention. So, this is a principle-based approach. This is what? Principle-based approach. It depends on facts and circumstances. Here, whatever I told, this is rule-based approach. I told only three things. That means, student can do anything beyond that. But if I told, you have to pay complete focus and attention in the class. I don't want any kind of deviation. That is a principle based approach. I am not giving you strict rules and regulations. I told you my objective. I want this thing to happen. So all that things which is creating disturbance to that should be avoided. That is a principle based approach. Understood? So even in the ethics to be followed by the auditors also, there are two kinds of approach. One is principle based approach. Other one is rule based approach. In the rule based approach, strict rules and regulations will be there which you have to follow. In case of principle based approach, it all depends on professional judgment. Sir, which one auditors have to follow? What kind of approach ICI will take in implementing ethics? They use a combination. They will have principle-based approach also. They will have rule-based approach also. That means they have given certain rules. Along with that, they have given some scope for professional judgment also. They follow a combined approach for implementing ethics for the chartered accountants. Just this much you remember. So with this, we are successfully done with revising the chapter Nature, Objective and Scope of Audit.